a major MLB Palooza. Opening day is right around the corner, seven days from the day that we are recording this episode of Vicious Talk with Benny P. And my guest today is going to be none, uh, one of my favorite guests, bringing him back here. We had a very popular episode maybe like a few months ago, talking some World Series. It was in October, actually. We talked a little bit about the World yep. Series back then. My cousin, Nick Burrow. Nick, welcome back, buddy. How's it going? Glad to be back, Ben. You know, I kind of, uh, I should have listened to the the podcast I was on to make sure I could, uh, <laughs> don't say anything contradictory or anything stupid, but hey, glad to be back, man. <laughs> yeah, we're going to try to trap you here on Vicious Talk. We got to get you to like, yeah, you got to complete 360 or 180 or uh, some of your opinions and you can call it a flip flopper or something like that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I just hope your trivia is not as hard as last time. That was no, embarrassing, man. No, no, no. I, you know, what's funny is I got a, a baseball trivia book for Chris, for Christmas, one of my um, aunts and uncles that when they the family the Vermilias, they gave me a baseball trivia book. And so I, okay. lo- I was looking up trivia for opening day, and so I was looking okay. through. Okay. Yeah, so like we got that. the opening day theme, you know, exciting twenty twenty one season yeah. right around the corner. You know, we got you know you and I at heart, you're a Padres guy, and I'm an Angels guy, and our our teams for different reasons are. I mean, we're both hoping to. Padres more likely than the Angels to be a successful team this year, uh, but you know the Angels are turning a little, turning some heads in the spring uh, and some of the spring performances. So we'll get to that obviously on yeah. the pod. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the the season has so many storylines. You know, bustling in, in this, in this, you know, heading into opening day and to start the new season. It's the first year. Um, you know, they took the, they had the shortened season last year, so it's been a while since these guys have played 162 within a, what is a six month span, five month span, yep. you know, mm-hmm. it, it's a lot of baseball and, you know, it, there's the, a lot of the storylines are how our teams bulking up their pitching staffs to cover all this extra baseball that they're going to be having to reacclimate to um, after taking, you know, the, basically the, the year long break. I mean, for a lot of teams, they only played 60 games last year, missing the playoffs. Yeah. For, I mean, a lot of teams barely, you know, played any postseason if anything. And, you know, this season is going to be different and we got to, you know, we wanted to, Nick and I wanted to, you know, flush out some of the details of what we're looking at heading into, you know, an an interesting 2021 season. Yeah, man. I mean, it's going to be, it's, it's so funny. It feels like it's been forever since we've had baseball, even though like the end of the world series has been like the same forever, but I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just because we we've been without or our last year, it felt like we didn't get enough even though it was such a concentrated yeah. effort to have 60 games. But way. I mean, is it only, is it just me or just spring no. training feel like it's taken forever? Yeah. It feels like we were shortchanged last year. I mean, yeah, especially exactly. since, you know, we're not necessarily Dodger fans. So we got shortchanged by, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 d- yeah. disappointing at best outcome of the world series. <laughs> but that's true. Uh, you know, just the 60 games that came and went so fast and yeah, for for especially i mean my angels were they were gone like this this season came and went and there's a lot of disappointing storylines it's the the you know shadows of that whole storyline with the angels of tyler skaggs and his overdose uh two years ago that's still you know putting that behind the team and uh yeah the the whole culture has been shifting it feels like this is the the first year that it's felt like it's uh, a new system or a new a new vibe around the team, at least in the spring training experience. Yeah. I mean, I, I sure, I sure hope so. I, I mean, I don't know if you want to dig into this now, but I'm, I have very specific opinions on the angels <laughs> in general. I mean, I think they need, I, I, I don't know how the, you know, the organization works, but as far as like ownership or whatever, but they need to, in my opinion, they need to absolutely fire their head of marketing they need to revamp everything. Just the entire attitude around that that team is so lax. I mean, I just don't, you know, like for years, and this has changed in the spring, which is so interesting, but I, I, for years I felt like you have Mike Trout on your team. He is such an impact player. How is there not a sense of urgency to like, dude, we need to get to the playoffs every year. And like they say that, they say that, but – I think they just need a change. Look at the Padres. They added Brown. And like, I swear that just fired up everybody, players, front office fans. I think the <laughs> angels should so go think- back to the California angels. Okay. They just, so need, a, they just need to, it's a, a uniform thing. it's a uniform thing. It's, 
It's it's a it's brand, a, a vibe. and you know this is my like yeah yes it's a vibe. I think they just are so, they're a tired organization, and I think the fans you reflect that. In but the to fans. fix to fix something that's tired, you want to go back to an old logo, the California. That's logo. what the Padres did. <laughs> the Padres were brown, yeah. and you know for years, and they they banged it, and they went blue. I you know, and I uh, liked the blue. But to me, it was more. It was less about the color. It was more about like, look, we're it's time to turn a page. We've been bad for long enough. The Angels won a World Series in 2002, okay? Yeah. That was not that long ago. But, like, do you feel the same energy like the monkey? When the monkey, you know, the rally time monkey goes on the screen, I'm like, who cares? For for me, people forget often the Angels are really, really good during that. Vladimir Guerrero, Garrett Anderson, Mm Tori Hunter, uh, Jared Weaver as the ace, you know, Kelvin Escobar, John Lackey, Francisco Rodriguez, like that core was really good up until about 2009, 2010. They were one of the best teams in baseball. I mean, in 2005, in my opinion, they were gypped of the world series and that's a whole nother story, but it was that it was, (laughs) it was the the white Sox, the white Sox series in the ALCS. Oh yeah. You know what? If you bring it up, white Sox Sox fans get so mad at you. If if you bring it up, they say you're just a hard, uh, a hard, hard sore loser but mm-hmm. if with with the angels they you're touching on a lot of points that uh, i i agree with you to an extent i i the most disappointing aspect of the angels organization for me does come from the ownership side they have a very uh confusing top-down approach with the way that they run the organization and, and but what i mean is it seems like a lot of the worst aspects of the team are the ones that come straight down from the top with Artie moreno and as okay, as, yeah. as as the owner i mean you look at some of the poor the poor signings that really ha- handicap this team's ability and flexibility to succeed over the last five or six years that you're talking about where they struggled because they had all these really bad contracts and really bad yeah. decisions that they made in the early decade in, from about 2011 to 2013 and maybe 2014. And so they were making a lot of poor decisions in the front office yeah. and they were ripping yeah. a lot of the, you know, the, the uh, unfortunate benefits of a lot of those decisions during these years that you're talking about. And yeah. I, I think that we're finally starting to see a little bit of a shift in that. But my point with Artie Moreno was that, he got involved with, you know, some of the really poor signings. Like, I mean, he was involved to an extent with Pujols, but, you know, in my opinion, we, we could talk about Pujols in a, a, a different times and stuff like that. But in my, my opinion, Pujols signing wasn't all that bad. Uh, the ones that were really oh. bad was the Josh Hamilton sign. That was terrible because not only did they, did they spend all that money on a guy that barely even, barely even played for them and, you know, it was a huge headache in the locker room and all the off-field stuff that he had with the substance, the substance stuff. But, uh, they end up missing out on, on re re-signing Tory Hunter, who is a guy that Mike Trout, when he was coming, really loved to play with, really looked up yeah. to him, and was certainly a, a disappointing, you know, outcome for Trout. And and Hunter ended up having a, a good season or two more with a couple of good seasons with Detroit. You know, he still had a little bit of juice in the tank. And they could have had – I would have taken those Hunter years over the Josh Hamilton experience any day. T.J. Wilson yeah. was a questionable one. You know, and now they have the the Justin Upton signing that's you know handicapping them a little bit still, and just a lot of of those types of things. I I think I think uh, Upton falls into the Pujols thing from a production standpoint because obviously Upton's not Albert Pujols. We all know that, but I mean, I can see the guy dropping twenty twenty plus. I'm with you on Upton. I like Upton more than the next guy, but I'm just saying the general consensus on Upton is that absolutely he's one of those guys that falls in the same bucket as Pujols, where the general consensus, the people that aren't you know watching the team day in and day out don't think yeah. that Pujols and, and Upton bring any value to the team and that's just wrong right right um, no, I have, no I, you're absolutely right and uh I, I think it's funny because you look back and and I try to think off the top of my head like what are the some of the better you know moves that organization has made you know obviously Rendon comes to mind he's like arguably one of the better players yeah. in baseball and it's funny um, they're only one year into that contract but you already feel like I mean that guy's worth every penny you spend on him you keep oh unbelievable on yeah. both sides of the ball it and, makes it I look mean, so just, easy he, he, he yeah. fits the angels kind of culture too where the angels are just so casual and like uh-huh. so laid back and just so not an intense ball club and that's really rendon yeah. style rendon you right. know, he's, good- he's not a bryce harper he's not a you know um no and he's at he, it, you know what you're gonna get from him and that's a superstar you know that's a superstar um you know what i will say it's so funny that 
one move that they made that really excited me is bringing on Matt Vaskersian to do the play-by-play. And, and is, it's, it's a typical Artie Moreno move. The guy is, typical, is all typical. about the popular, the popular names. Like he's, yeah. he's all about the show and you know, uh-huh. and literally, I mean, pun intended, I guess in this case. And um, yeah, <laughs> it, it was this fast version that you know it's kind of a gimmick you just see he's like not even doing he doesn't know how many games he's going to be doing he's gonna be doing all of them <laughs> remotely so he's never going to be like at angel stadium like you, you know uh being involved with the fans and stuff why like that it's, it's a it, money grab doing it remote it's 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 he makes more money i mean the guy the angels probably paid him a lot of money the angels have one of the best tv contracts in the league and uh, makes sense. The, yeah, and that excursion, you know, they probably paid him per, a pretty penny. But the also so probably in Don Sutton, who's uh, I was I was listening to to him today, and he uh, he he's a San Diego guy too. He, mm-hmm. he yeah. and uh, he's he's not bad. He he likes to uh, uh, get flourish. He likes to flourish with his words. You know, he got, sometimes he gets okay. on. Yeah. He gets he gets caught up with the storytelling. I guess what I was gathering. He likes to talk. Yeah. You know, but, I, I didn't realize that about Matt Vaskirjan. That's kind of a bummer. Um, I guess uh, he's probably hanging on to some of his national contracts. I do contracts like Vaskirjan. Don't, don't, I you know, oh, yeah. don't count me a complainer. I think it's cool to, you know, bring him into the Angels family. But, you know, I don't yeah. think, I think more than anything, it was, it was a name, it was a name thing. You know, they, which is what you're saying, right? It's totally indicative of what's going on in the front office there and, you know, get, trying to get people excited, but, you know, worried yeah, about the wrong thing. <laughs> we're talking way too many, too much angels, and we haven't even just gotten to the AOS yet. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll yeah. retouch on some, a little bit of that stuff, but, you yeah. know, I, I could talk to angels all day, dude. We, uh-huh. we got a lot of baseball ahead, uh, <laughs> yeah. ahead of us. We're late, late March now, and there's a lot of, you know, interesting aspects to the season that teams are adjusting to, and, and you know, there's still a lot of things with the rules that are a little bit up in the air, so – I mean, what you're you're a National League guy. You, you're a Padres guy. What's your take on the the DH in, in for the National League? There's no, there is gonna, there's gonna, there's gonna be no DH this year. But they're saying yeah. that a lot of guys are prepping for this to be the final season. You know, ne- so, they think next year is going to be the year that they make the permanent switch. It's so hard because you know I look back at last year and I think, okay, that was good. Like that was great. Um, but you know, I think at a full 162, I. I don't know. I'm a purist. I think I kind of like the the no DH in the National League, and it's not from a strategy standpoint. It's just like I, I like I like the your game. You you love the beauty of the sport. You likes the game. You I, like I, the yeah, gamesmanship, I just, I, and just I, the, I, I can yeah, see why you would be a guy that appreciates right the pitcher and, hitting. You know, and I I think that like the pitcher hitting slows it down a little bit, but I think that it's a uh, it's indicative of a of a of a larger scope like. It's, I, you know, Rob Manfred's whole thing of like, it's a cultural you know, thing, to play, whatever. But like, I don't think that having, you know, I don't think 20 minutes taken off of the, the game times bringing in new fans, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, so why, why switch it? Like the only thing that I will say with the DH is that it opens up 15 more jobs, right? I think about a guy like Mitch Moreland. Like he didn't yeah. play extremely he's not even signed. well after oh, no, the deadline. He did sign. Yeah, he did sign. Right. I, I like think with he's, San Diego, uh, yeah. he didn't play that well. He was unbelievable in Boston. And then he didn't play that well with San Diego. But, like, look, that guy, if you're telling me, like, do I want Mitch Moreland on my roster to, like, swing for the fences, like, three times a game? Absolutely, I do. Do I want him pinch hitting late against hard-throwing righties? Absolutely, I do. So, from that standpoint, I like it. But the other thing is, I just like, especially with interleague play, like, I don't don't really know schedule-wise what we're looking at with that. But, like, interleague play, I love love that. I love that, hey, we're playing – you know, Seattle, we get a DH for this weekend, right? Or like Seattle's coming down now. These yeah. AL guys got a hit. And yeah. for me, it's not really about the game of baseball. It's more just like, I kind of like the variance. You know what I mean? Like I like the, I don't know. For don't for know. me, the ultimate thing that is the, you know, the, the red herring in the argument or that, that the, it, the, the, like the end all be all part of the argument for me is, I just don't want to see pitchers get injured while they're hitting. And that happens way too too. often. That happens way too often. It's like the pitchers are meant to, you know, pitch for your teams. You want them to, you know, earn all their value by throwing the baseball. And when they get hurt by doing something that you don't necessarily need them to do, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you hate to see it. It does suck. You hate to see see that. I mean, 
And it Honestly, happens often. I'm people the... be like, that, how often does it, people ask, you know, how often does that happen? It does. It happens. It happens. Yeah. Bunting, dude, these guys don't know how to bunt. You, you know, there was a guy recently by... that hurt, uh, hurt his core or yeah. hurt his back. Hurt yeah, his back. Swinging, swinging, swinging. not pitching. You know I don't was. remember who it was, but uh, I saw that on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who that was, but absolutely. Like right there, I was like, all right. I mean, there's, there's one example of how guys, you know, I, so I'll say that, but I'll raise you this. Um, Madison Bumgarner in his prime. That dude raked. Yeah. Didn't he like eight? One of my one favorite, or something? you know, we're talking about opening day, opening day. One of my favorite opening day moments. I went to a D-backs Giants game and Bumgarner was starting for the Giants opening day. Hit two? He hit two, he hit two dingers in AZ. Good. Remember that. He had some bombs. Dude, that, that guy was, swings that was, that was, hard. That was a cool opening day moment. Definitely. Yeah, I definitely don't like Madison Baumgartner, but no. respect. I mean, good swing. Good swing. Yeah. On the right side. I mean, 2-0, that guy, you got to be careful, you know? And, yeah. like, I respect that. But I think overall the, we're heading towards the DH. I don't know if I'm, like, stoked about it, but I think that's where it's going to head. Um, but either look, way, I mean, I, if Mad Bum's pitching, you don't have to use the DH. You can yeah. elect to, you know, not That's use true. it. That's so, true. That's fair. And what about like Jacob Degrom? Good hitter, decent yeah. hitter for the nine hole. Like I don't know. You know, sometimes maybe you have to. Or I, I'm With, not sure. I mean, but Shohei Otani. You, you got him batting lead off. Well, right, starting I mean, pitching. We're going like... to talk, <laughs> talk about him. Because my yeah, God, that was incredible. <laughs> that was the first time anybody had done that in a big league game or a professional game since I think they said 1901 that someone had batted Jeez. lead off and started pitched. And the guy did he not also do good. Flies, by the way. Yeah, he's very fast, dude. Um, what some major trends that I want to talk about? Um, heading into this season with a lot of the individual players, there's a lot of, a lot of cases where p- guys are falling into one of two categories. And those two categories are one, they used the pandemic impacted season in 2020 to take time off one or get healthy. I mean, to, maybe they only played the 60 games or maybe they played a per, only a small percentage of those 60 games, or they, you know, elected to take the whole season off. A lot of guys are, are in that boat. And they took time off to get healthy, get their bodies right. And we're seeing a lot mm-hmm. of guys, you know, coming into camp with the mindset, you know, I'm a different person. I'm a different player now. I got my body right. I'm ready for a, a full season. I'm, I'm ready to go. It's kind of like the reset button. This is the reset I, button, guys. I, I think it's a case-by-case case basis, but I think generally yeah. you and I side, you and I side with the, you know, you are who you are at this point in your career. Um, not this is the big leagues, man. Yeah. Like you, nobody, this isn't, this isn't college, right? You're not finding your swing. Like these guys got to the big leagues for one reason. Obviously it's a game of adjustments, but you know, uh, people talk about Dodgers fans, you know, I've heard Dodgers fans talk about, Oh, well just wait till David price gets out there. And like, for me, I'm like, David price is the David price. I know. Right. Like he's not getting any younger. He's, I, I don't yeah. know, dude. I kind of like David Price. He he actually like he, David Price. He was good for the Red Sox in 2018, and he was good in his in uh, the amount of games that he did pitch in 2019. He got hurt that year, um, and then he missed the whole 2020 season with the you know baseball out COVID. is a baseball, and this ties in exactly to what you're saying. Baseball is a what have you done for me lately type game. Yeah, you know who said that. Lots of people have said that, but I heard Khalil Green <laughs> say it. So that's what I'm going to give him, give him a quote to yeah. my boy. Yeah. But like, I really, it. I mean, what have you done for me lately? Like I, I feel for you. me, a lot it, of those guys got to like prove a, it. You know, they yeah, got to prove I, it. I mean, if it's a family thing, I understand like you got a family, you got to play things safe that I totally respect that. But for me, like I, if I'm a player, I'm not missing out on 60 games or whatever. If they were playing five games, I'll be there for all five because that's the type of game it is, man. I mean, we, we, we can talk about Wally Pip, that story, you know, the Wally Pip story. I mean, you, you know, you hear about players coming in and, and making an impact. And then the guy that they, they spot, they never play again. Right. Like yeah. look at Randy Rosarena. Like you think that guy is, he would consider taking time off. Like, no, like that guy, <laughs> he's got something uh, to prove in an organization like the Rays. Like, absolutely, he's capitalizing on that. So I, I you think you know Randy. You know Randy's doing that. You gotta, <laughs> you, <know him. laughs> you gotta respect Randy, man. Yeah, don't don't you put don't you badmouth Randy's name. He's you know he's gonna be playing all all five of his games. At five out of five games, he'll play a ball. Five out of five, baby. Yeah, <laughs> dude. So 
I, that's one that's one type of player we're seeing coming to the year. The yep. guys that, you know, they took the, the time off to try to get healthy, and we'll see how those people do. But there's also a lot of guys that had unusually – down years last year a lot of uh, yeah. with considering the the weird circumstances with the pandemic impacted year a lot of players are looking to have bounce back seasons in 2021 a lot of you know guys who we expect to ha- to be some of this game's best players we're talking yeah. about like, the christian yelich's the javier Baez's, is chris bryant's there's a lot of these guys that had poor years last year and um and- we'll, we'll, they're looking oh, jose altuve's you know, the, a lot of these mm-hmm. guys, the shortened year was whatever, for whatever reason, it, it just didn't vibe with their style of play. They either were pressing. Yeah. I know um, I did a lot, a, a decent amount of reading up on Cattell Marte coming to this season for the Diamondbacks. He's Good somebody player. that talked about how he was swinging on a lot of three, and know, and three and one counts going outside of the strike zone because he felt like he had to make things happen with the shortened season, the limited yeah. amount of bats. He had to, you know, go out of his comfort zone to mm-hmm. try to make things happen. And you know, what happened is his, his, his average hard hit, I mean, his average exit velocity of his hits went down. His K rate went down because he was swinging a lot of pitches, making a lot of contact, but soft contact and his, and his mm-hmm. walk rate also walk rate also went down. So the guy, those are just the types of examples that we're talking about with these players that, you know, they struggled last year because baseball is such a mental sport that when you know yeah. you don't have 162 games to work out every kink in, in your swing and work out, work through every slump that you, you're going to, you're going to inevitably come through, you, you press a little bit, your mental state changes and it's hard to avoid that sometimes. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, the, you know, mistakes are magnified in a sh- smaller sample size for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Yelich. I think he's a perfect example. You like, you look at Yelich's, you know, days in Miami, you know, certainly a good player, right? Like a very exciting player. And you think he's going to break out, but the guy's an MVP, right? The guy's an MVP candidate every year. You might think when he gets to Milwaukee and for him to have this kind of tough year, I mean, people ask, I've talked to people, they go, Oh, is Yelich a question mark? And like, no, I don't think Yelich is a question mark. Right. I think he's going to hit 300. And that and seems to be the general consensus. Homers. But what if, what if Yelich, what if Yelich just started to decline starting last year? That's true. That's true. I mean, that's yeah, a, if, that's if, a worry. If, that's a legitimate worry for a lot of these guys. You know, yeah, was last year well, the start of something worrisome? Right. Or, or you could look at it this way: Is the dam has the damage been done? I mean, there are mental, you what stories. If, yeah, yeah. What if he lost his confidence? Mental, Right. And that if you lose your confidence, you're done. Yeah. You can't play in the Yelich, big leagues without Yelich that confidence. Changed, made some changes to his swing mid season last Absolutely. year. He was yeah. he he used to get really low in his in his stance, get wide and really anchor with his bottom half and drive off that. And it wasn't working for him. And he started to stand up taller and he he, mm-hmm. he you know lost a little bit of that crouch and athleticism that you get from being down low. I I, yeah. I think he's somewhere in the middle from what I've seen in, in the limited the limited film that I've seen of him this yeah. spring, I think he's somewhere in between the, you know, the crouch stance and the upright, but. Um, speaking of, uh, speaking of different stances, Cody Bellinger. Cody yeah. Bellinger's opened up. He's, he's made a change. Well, having uh, 162 I'm, games might be a reason why people are, some of these guys are willing to experiment with this because they know they have right. some time to work through it. So, yeah, I mean, you've seen theme. it time and time again. Like, we see superstars that start slow, that start slow, and then you look at their stat line at the end of the year, they're right there where you expect, right? I mean, and, and then – but then – and then it's funny because you got to consider other guys. Like, you look at Anthony Rendon. Rendon started slow in a 60-game season, and look at his stat line at the end. The guy was right there. So, mm. it, it's totally crazy. And, you know, it's about these different kind of personalities and these different kinds of, uh, you know, mental – uh, the mental aspect of the game, like you're talking about, is it affects guys differently. So it'll be it'll be Definitely. interesting to see, you know, how it affects it. Definitely, I think one of the biggest storylines for the spring training as well is how great Francisco Lindor has looked for the New York mm. Mets. The Mets are a yeah. team that uh, they get overshadowed a little bit by the New York Yankees because they're obviously in the same city, or you know, right. New York New Yorkers will say Flushing and Queens are very different, but essentially the same city and. Um, <laughs> Francisco Lindor looks great for New York. He he's put been putting up great stats. He's hit. I think he hit another bomb today. He's got five homers. I think on the wow. uh, the spring you know season, and he looks like he's in great shape. He posts yeah. a lot on Instagram. You know he fits the New York's culture, and he looks mm-hmm. like it looks like the Mets really nailed someone that they've been dreaming about. 
you know, yeah. making their, their franchise around. And now they have Lindor and DeGrom, and that's two of the best, most valuable eight players in this sport at, you know, Absolutely. probably. And yeah. the Mets got something and, you know, they're going to be a team that a lot of people are picking in, in their preseason picks to win the NL East. And it, they're, they're going to have a lot of eyes on them to say the least. And we'll see if they yeah. live up to the hype. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think you, you know, you always have to take spring training stuff with a grain of salt, mm-hmm. but in this case, I think you have to pay attention to Lindor. I mean, in my opinion, in the last year, Lindor has been a guy that some questions have been raised with, you know, I mean, he started so hot and he's, you know, popped from both sides of the plate. Um, in my opinion, I think he's a top, I think he's a top five shortstop in baseball. Um, let me check that in my head, but uh, oh, no, yeah. I, he, dude, he might be number team. one for me. I mean, there's a lot of great shortstops. I mean, Tatis obviously is your boy, but I mean, he's story. right there with the Tatis, his story, Trey Turner's, Corey Seager's. I mean, I you know, probably, the, one, the only one that I, I definitely would not, be, I would not question you on. It would be if you, if you said Tatis, but the thing, the way, the thing with Lindor is he switch hits. That's I'd love that. That's so I valuable. That I mean, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. No, you're absolutely right about the Mets. I mean, I think, in my, and I mean, selfishly, as it's a good Padres for the fan, sport, I, I think when, it uh, when New York teams sport. are good. Yeah, you know, you need a little bit of that. I mean, I think in the last couple of years, we've seen uh, the East Coast bias thing kind of go away a little bit and a mm-hmm. little bit more attention on the West Coast. I mean, if you look at just the player pool, I mean, I'm going to say four of the, you know, top 10 players in baseball are in California. I mean, Trout. You got, uh, you got I mean, Trout, Tatis, Machado, Bellinger. Bets. I mean, bets. It's just ridiculous, right? Yeah. I mean, so, but no, I, I absolutely agree. I think that I think the Mets are an exciting team. I mean, as a Padres fan, I was telling you this earlier. I hope that the Mets win the East because if the Padres are in a wild card situation, <laughs> I do not want anything to do with Jacob Degrom in yeah. a one game series. Oh my God, he looks amazing. He's throwing like what did he? What was, was his fastball velocity in spring? Was was it one hundred and two? One hundred two. Yeah, oh 102 God. with a 94 mile per hour slider oh and a God. dirty changeup. Dude, that How's guy. That fair? I, I I told you I say this all the time. The guy is the greatest success story in this history of the Tommy John surgery. He's like I think eight or nine years removed from the surgery, and his ligament is still thriving, and he gets better every season. What? How does he get this far removed from a surgery like that and, and continue to throw harder? It's incredible. The guy's not real. I. I don't know. And, and, and you know, what's funny. I bet you there are people that don't even know he had the surgery. I bet you there are fans yeah. out there that love him that don't know. Yeah. I remember his rookie year when he came out in the, the uh, Lions in the main? game. Oh my God. He was unbelievable. 2015. Yeah. That guy always was had unbelievable. Stuff. And he's just better and better and throws harder and is sharper. And he's, by the way, he's not, he's, he's different than like a Syndergaard 102. This guy's 102 on the black. Like, yeah. The, the accuracy, the control that he exhibits. The command. Both it, sides it's of the play, it's up and down. It's incredible. He's unbelievable. And yeah. you know, I was, I was having this conversation with a buddy. I was like, who's the best pitcher you've seen with your, your own two eyes? And like, for me, I'm, I like Kershaw, maybe, right? Like Pedro up there. But dude, yeah. DeGrom is getting there, man. He's like, getting he, there. I mean, he, he doesn't benefit from like the, some of the great lineups that like you've seen in Los Angeles or you've seen. Um, you know, with Boston and, and, you know, those guys, but my goodness, I mean, dumb, yeah. dumb. Yeah. I can't even believe when he won He's the, so when good. he won the Cy Young, I couldn't believe that there was even a discussion. Like <laughs> they were talking, Oh, he doesn't have the wins. I don't care. They yeah. can't hit him. They can't he's, hit him. It, he's unbelievable. I, I really, I think baseball fans are craving a, a vintage Jacob deGrom postseason performance. It's possible we see that this year. I mean, I if it. we saw the Mets in the wild card round, the one game, the one game to, you know, w- winner take all, that would be incredible to see right off the bat to start the playoffs. And then just to see him progress and see how often he could throw to carry a staff in a, play, in yeah. a postseason run. Let me ask you this, and then we can move on because I know we're kind of lagging. But I was having this uh, debate with my buddy. Is there a world, is there any situation that Jacob deGrom doesn't start a one-game playoff for the New York Mets? No. Now, let if, me – If it's a one-game, winner-take-all, you, you play your best guy. You go with Jacob deGrom. 
that now that's that's what I said. Now he brought up this point. Say you're game 161, 162, fighting for a playoff spot, magic numbers one, something like that, right? Because the NL East is tight. The NL East is tight. I like all now, five if, teams. I told you this. I, I like now, I like every so, team. Let me take you into this scenario. You tell me what you do. You're in game. Let's just for conversation's sake, since we can, let's say you have like a three-way tie going into 162, right? You've manipulated your rest and whatever. You have DeGrom available. I don't know what the schedule looks like. I will bet they've they there's enough off days to make it like at least three, four days rest. Do you save DeGrom with risk on throwing him short rest in a one-game playoff scenario? With my my strategy with this is you always throw the guy. If you have a chance to clinch that game, you always throw your guy. So if I wouldn't save okay. him, if that's the question, like I, I, I would if if I have you a chance to today. clinch, yeah. If I have a, if I win today and I clinch, you know the N, the NL East division title, I, I, I'm pitching Jacob Degrom if he's available. Okay, okay. I mean that's fair. I, that's I think some of if that can't is, go is in the wild card how... game. He can't go. You know. That's, yeah. That's Even though thought. I think he I think he would. Right. I mean. Yeah. I, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I have to assume there's two days off in between. Yeah. And I think he's okay pitching on three days rest. Like, yeah, there's no way. Right. So oh, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Interesting. Nick, have you uh, been watching any of the spring training games? Have you, have you seen anybody that you, that, you know, stuck out to you so far in, in some of the games that you've, you've seen? Uh, yeah. I mean, you, it's hard to not lead off with Shohei. I mean, the guy's hitting like little league numbers yeah, about off it. of big league pitching. He's hitting what? He had another homer today. Did you see him hit? He had like a, a fastball <clears throat> inside corner and he just hit a long fly ball out to the opposite field down the line. Left and field he, line, yeah. Right? Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. He's I mean, strong. if he's the real deal, which it looks like he is, you have to start having the, AL MVP conversation. And we've talked about this separately. And I don't know if you want to save this to the end. Yeah, we'll go over the MVP odds at the end. But he's he's a guy that he's his odds are very intriguing from where he sits yeah. in the AL, AL MVP conversation. You know who else I like is Jock Peterson. I mean, I've always been a Jock Peterson guy. I think he has a role. Yeah. Um, I think his role to just mm-hmm. go up there and swing the bat, I, I do like that. Um, With Peterson – I yeah I think he's got like five home runs or six home runs already on spring with me with me the big thing that I've seen with him this spring is he changed his batting stance a little bit he's more athletic he's he's standing Mm -hmm. more on the balls of his feet and he's kind of leaning out towards more of the play a little bit and he's just ready he's more balanced and he's able he's able to drive the ball the opposite way a lot better instead of because you know with the Dodgers he was very relaxed he would sit back on his heels you know really Mm -hmm. feel like really loose and that was what he clearly was thinking he wanted to be really really loose and then you know attack when the ball came as he would he was no holding back he would swing as hard as he could but the way he's hitting now it's a little bit more like Ben Zobra style where he's a little bit more balanced he's driving the ball the opposite way maybe he loses a little bit of the power but he's so strong it doesn't really matter yeah so it's also so it's also I think he I think that move cuts down on the chasing a little bit because he was so so susceptible to like a 2-0 changeup or something like that you know and mm-hmm. like I think the ability to be more athletic through the swing is is something that's going to help him from a strikeout standpoint and that's totally plagued him his entire career is you know they always talking about the strikeouts and like I don't care but yeah. it is a factor it is yeah. a thing he's looked good this spring I think it's legit I think he he, they were thinking originally, I believe they were going to play him in a, in a platoon with Jake Marisnik and Marisnik's looked great in the spring exposure that he's been getting, but Jock Peterson, if he's playing, if he's going to play like this, he's going to get the everyday job in left field. He's playing really well. Um, yeah. One guy that he, well, had a lot of hype coming up and, you know, he might be getting a little bit of, you know, some steam, you know, regathering here behind him is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. He's been somebody, yeah. you know, people really loved him coming up and looks like, you know, the story with him was that he was impacted heavily by a lack of facilities to work out in when the pandemic hit. He, uh, the story was that he, you know, after spring tr- training last year, got put on pause. He had nowhere to go to work out, to train during that, that long break. And he wasn't physically right. ready for the season when it came is, is what right. he's kind of explained. And he looks like he spent a lot of time during the off season trying to get his body right. He does look a little bit more fit, looks a little, a little trimmer. He's playing a little bit of third base now. You know, I know that he put some weight on, so they tried to move him away 
from that more towards DH and first base. But I think, you know, he wants to play the field and he wants to play third base if he can. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, he wanted to get in shape for this because he looks good this spring. Yeah, no. And and I think that what that does to a mentality of a player is, you know, if he can prepare himself to do, you know, more than just a DH or first base, which are important roles, of course, but you know, if he's, if his body is improved and he can play some third base, I think that's just going to build the confidence up. And like we were talking about, that's so huge for such a young player. Yeah. I I hope for a big season out of him. I I mean, Vladimir Guerrero, his dad was one of my favorite players of all time. And to see his son, to see his son have a similar career, or, I mean, if, that you could say all you want about Vlad, whether or not you liked him or not, but Vladimir Guerrero, his dad, but the guy was one of the most fun players to watch hitting balls off oh, the yeah. ground, being so oh, yeah. aggressive at the plate, the, you had to the, love the, that can, guy. the cannon of an arm in the right field. And when he was with the Expos, how athletic he was and how mm-hmm. graceful he was in the outfield, how fast and athletic he was. It was, yeah. it was a sight to see one of the best players in the sport in his, in his heyday. And his son has a lot of similar skills, just, you know, thicker body. So we'll see if how. Yeah how it works out yeah. that way, but mm-hmm. hopefully it plays well. Um, Agreed. The, the other, the other individual performance that I think you got to point out with the angels is the way that uh, Andrelton Simmons is replacement this year. Jose Iglesias has been playing at shortstop. I mean, did you see some oh, yeah. of the defensive plays that he's been making? Incredible that, dude. Inc- that, yeah. Unbelievable. Like yeah, some of the best plays I've ever seen yeah. out of the shortstop position type of plays. Yeah. You have to wonder if he's practicing that or if he's just that uh, good off on his uh, feet. I mean, the, the it's hard plays, to say. The, each of the plays that I'm thinking of, it, the one he made yesterday where he was going to his left and dove at a ball basically that was past him and then mm-hmm. rolled over on his butt and threw a perfect throw to first base. That was unbelievable. Like the whole yeah. way I was thinking, oh, that's a hit. That's a hit. Oh, damn, that's a hit. And then no way, no way. Oh, my God, no way. The ball's yeah. in the air. It's going to bounce. It's yeah. going to go. Like, no way. And a it good catches throw. It. Perfect throw. Oh, unbelievable. It, it was unbelievable. I thought there was a 0% chance that he was going to make that play. I couldn't believe yeah. it. And then he's he, been and he's been like that most of his career. And he's just it seems like he gets better, honestly. Yeah. Seems, yeah. Which he is, looks he looks healthy, which is the thing you want to see with a guy like him because he's yeah. he's had some injuries over his career. But the, mm-hmm. you know, the knock with him was never his glove. The guy's been an excellent fielder oh, his yeah. single career. Um, oh yeah. That play he made too when he was coming in, he barehanded it and just all, all in one motion flicked it over to first base. That's a, that's an incredible play, too. I love that one. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm a defense guy. Uh, that I know the game has kind of moved away from that. You see shortstops that are 6'5", six, 6'4", uh, six, you know, your Corey Seegers and stuff like that. Uh, kind of the Derek Jeter model. If you can hit, you can play. Uh, but I'm a defense guy. And I think, especially for a team like the Angels that have a Rendon, that have a Trout, it's nice to have that <laughs> out the middle, man. Yeah. You want to see that, especially yeah. from a pitching staff standpoint. Like, you need that extra out. You know, once yeah. every you know, and Simmons, you know series or whatever. Simmons, you're never going to upgrade from an Angleton Simmons defensively, but I mean, Jose Iglesias is trying to, but you make a run for it. You know, he's been playing yeah. really well there in the spring. Hopefully, yeah. that continues for the Angels' sake. Um, yeah. One really cool aspect of uh, the sport in general, but you know that we're starting to see in spring because we want we gauge a lot of we in baseball. It's a numbers game, and you gauge a lot of your opinions and your interpretations of how guys are performing based on the numbers they put out and stat cast, you know, the measurables with, you know, the biomechanics of players playing in the games measures all a lot of different aspects of the sport of baseball. Now, and it's cool that we're starting to see a lot of spring training facilities also incorporate stat cast into the, their fields and stuff like that. And really it's a shame that it's not in every ballpark at this point that the major leaguers play in, but I think it's in like 10, I think it, there's only 10 ballparks I've read. Um, it might be more. They, I'm sure they. I'm sure they add to it every year, but um, they have to. It's, they have it's to be not trying. every field, um, but it's. I I love mm-hmm. to see. I love to look at uh, where guys are. You know, at and these measurables like velocity and exit velocity and speed and stuff like that for pitchers like. There, you if a guy had a down down velocity year last year, you want to see them, you know, come into spring training with some extra oomph on their fastball. So like guys like ba- Madison Bumgarner took a dip last year and he's back up to his career average about 91, 92. He was throwing like 89 last year. Yeah. And so those yeah. are the type of things. I mean, you want guys if if you're hoping for a healthier season, it's good to see the stats and, and stat cast show it that they're healthy. Yeah. Um, I mean, how about Robbie Ray? That guy, I mean, yeah. big, you know, high strikeout guy, but never really knows where he's going, but that guy's, 
that guy's throwing 96, 97 miles an hour. He was never that guy. I mean, he's been, he's thrown that hard, but he's never been sitting there. You know, that's, that's cool. I mean, I think that's, that shows. And it's kind of going back to what we were saying about like what last year meant to some guys, right? Like maybe, Definitely. you know, Robbie Ray took those, that easier year or that, you know, less innings on his arm and, and decided to bulk up a little bit. And I mean, he's been a high strikeout guy his entire career, but like, that extra two or three miles an hour can be the difference for some guys, I think. Yeah, Ray Ray is somebody that you we're waiting for him to put it all together, and it's about time that he yeah. did it. You know, he's, yeah. he's had the talent. It's time, it's, it's time, big boy. You know, be, be one of the best starters and be, be <laughs> yeah, the guy that it. you're Come supposed on. to be. You, you can know, do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but my, my point with the stat cast thing, too, is you get to see a lot of the prospects start to play in fields. Uh, for the first time that's measuring these things. So guys like Wander Franco, Key Brian Hayes, Hunter Green for the Reds, Josh Mears with San Diego hit a hunt. He had a home run 117.3 miles per hour. I, I'm telling you right now, a good like maybe five other hitters in the, the sport today could do that. Like it's only yeah. like, it's like Stanton, Stanton, Judge, maybe Gary Sanchez, um, maybe, maybe Trout. Uh, Jacob, I mean, Pete Alonzo. Uh, there's a there's very only small so many. Yeah. Yeah. Not, there's not, only so many. That is a not very impressive feat because it, when guys yes. are hit, when, hit, when the guys hit it that hard, it's usually a ground ball or a line out or, I mean, or, or a line drive. Right. Yeah. It's to not, get it up in the air and have yeah. it hit that hard is unbelievable. That was That's... very impressive. I mean, he's, he's a big bodied outfielder, kind of the guy that San Diego has been very prone to selecting, but not, you know, developing enough because guys like yeah. Hunter Renfro, Fran Mo Reyes, like they had those guys, the big bodied guys, and they didn't really pan out. We'll see if this if mirrors is, is a different story yeah. with them. Um, mm-hmm. But we're seeing, my point is we're seeing a lot of these, you know, young players for the first time show off, show their stuff off, you know, you start to see how fast guys are throwing, how, how hard they're hitting it. Guys like Bobby Witt Jr. for the Royals hit a couple bombs with the Royals in, in spring. Those are, those are really impressive too. Bobby Dahlbeck for the Red Sox. He's been a guy, a young prospect who's been, you know, crushing the ball for the Red Sox this spring. So for me, it's, I just really like seeing some of the numbers that these guys are putting up and it gets you excited for what they could do in come, come regular season time. Yeah, no, it just backs up the performance. You know what I mean? Like we talked about, you know, taking things with a grain of salt in spring training, but I mean, you can't argue with 117 off the bat, right? You can't argue with Hunter Green throwing 103 mile per hour fastballs. Like there are some lines that when you cross them, you have to start paying attention. So absolutely, yeah. I agree. Definitely. All right, Nick. Um, we have gotten about, about one hour to the podcast and we, we haven't even gotten to, we're going to break down the divisions here one by one. <laughs> and we, we've already talked so much detail about some of our favorite players and themes we're seeing in the sport. So we could, you know, you know, reference back to what we've been talking about, but we, we don't have to, you know, dive into detail that we've already discussed. Cause I mean, we, there's so many great topics that, talk about in 2021 because you know i got like we're explaining we felt short change last year we got we got stuff we want to get off our chest and we're excited for <laughs> we're excited for the upcoming year and you know we got our, some thoughts for each of the six divisions in the sport we're gonna you know go division by division we're gonna talk about who we who we like to win who our preseason pick to win a division are what are the best biggest x factors and, and story narratives heading into the into the season what's gonna you know what's going to define this division in the sport this year? What's, what's going to be the yeah. storyline that we're looking at? So let's we'll start off with, with your guys in the NOS, the Padres, the Dodgers, the Giants, the, uh, who am I forgetting? D-backs and the Rockies in the NOS. And it, it's an interesting division, but you know, this year it's really, it's the two at the top, the Dodgers and the Padres. I mean, they're your picks, the Padres to win it, right? I don't, that's not even a question worth asking, right? Yeah, I, I have to pick the Padres. I mean, <laughs> not only do I have to pick them, but I, I really believe it. I mean, you said it. I think it's a two horse race, um, two man game, two horse race. I, you, I think that the Dodgers are a excellent team, they're the World Series champs. Um, you know, I don't think they've gotten any worse in the last, you know, in the offseason. Um, but you have to consider the hunger aspect. And this is what I mean. The pot, the Dodgers took a long time to win a world series, right? They've been in the playoffs a lot. Now this is going to be kind of a hot take. I think 
this is this is very hot take. I think we we suffer. Baseball fans suffer from a little bit of overexposure to a team like the Dodgers. You know, I look at their lineup and I see Mookie Betts. Obviously, I see you know Turner. I see Seager. I see Pollock. I see Bellinger, and I see Muncie. But what I see is a lineup that the average fan is going to say is unbelievable, but they have not converted. They have not converted. They converted, you know, in the World Series. Yeah, people think- forget forget how much st- struggle they had before they finally pushed through last year. Yeah, and, struggle. And you yeah. know what? I'm not on board with the – I'm definitely not on board with the, oh, it's a fake Mickey Mouse World Series. No. Everyone had the same chance. Everyone played the same amount of games. Everyone did the same thing. So, hey, their World Series counts. But I look at a team like the Padres who – I'm. I will argue to my deathbed. Nobody has more fun on the baseball field than the San Diego Padres. Okay, <laughs> they're an exciting Slam team. Slam Diego, baby! You have to consider what they did this off season. You Darvish is a Cy Young. Blake Clearly, Snell they want to is win. a Cy Young. Denelson Lamette, if he is healthy, dark horse pick for the NL Cy Young. Joe Musgrove, I think, is only going to be better than what he showed. Chris Paddock had a bad year. I think Chris Paddock is a one of those guys we're talking about. One of those guys that we're talking about had an uncharacteristic, exactly. uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically poor 2020 season. I completely And he's trying agree. to get a bounce back year. I think that you're right. I think 2019 was more indicative of Paddock's ability than mm-hmm. 2020. So I think you're right. I, I'm very optimistic for the Padres this year. I think they, you're, you're, you're touching on something with the Dodgers. And I think what you're hinting at is, the Dodgers are only the third team in Major League Baseball history to make the to win their division eight years in a row or more. The only other teams mm-hmm. to do it were the Atlanta Braves, I think in the late nine or uh, I think yeah mid to late nineties into the two thousands, um, and then the, the New York Yankees, I think. Yankees. It, yeah. So those are the only two organizations to ever do it besides these these Dodgers, and yeah. the only team to win back to back World Series since the. I mean, to, the last team to do it were the Yankees in 1999, Yankees. 2000, uh, two, what, 98, 99, and 2000. They won three years in a row. Um, but I think we're going to see a little bit of a Dodgers World Series hangover is what I'm getting at. I think we're going to see a little know? bit of – it's very natural for a team to, especially for to how long the Dodgers struggled, how long they were so close to breaking through. And then finally, yeah. you know, they got, they got through, they got the World Series, they made it, they accomplished what they set out to do for all those years. And then how much of this year is going to be at least initially sit back and, you know, appreciate what we accomplished. And, you know, we're, we're just going to trust how good we are and we're going to coast to, you know, a playoff berth. And yeah. I think, I think there's going to be a little bit of that in the regular season at, the, at least. Yeah. And you know who, what comes to mind is uh, the 2016 Chicago Cubs. I mean, look what's happening to the Cubs. I, they, yeah. I mean, they're like the forgotten about team, right? I mean, yeah. most of those core players that you've seen, are still on the roster for now, but they have not looked competitive. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen in Los Angeles, but what I'm saying is, you know, you asked me who I think is going to win the West, and I think it's going to be the hungrier team. And right now I think the hungrier team is San Diego. Yeah, I and think, on, you know, yeah, from the I, roster standpoint, they're they're comparable, I think. I mean, both yeah. pitching staffs are unbelievable. Both, very both deep. lineups are it, great. It's funny is San Diego yeah. kind of has assembled a roster utilizing the strategies that the Dodgers perfected over the last few years with just a, yeah. a plethora of depth, guys with versatility, positional versatility, being right. able to play multiple positions really helps their roster and getting at the yeah. optimal lineup out every day. Um, having mm-hmm. a very deep pitching staff, a lot of young guys that they're going to be counting on out of, the, out of the bullpen and to make some spot starts. Guys like Mackenzie Gore, who is Major League Baseball's number two prospect. He's someone that the Padres have a lot of high hopes for coming into the season. He's definitely going to you know, be the next man up, it looks like, this once, uh, so if, if, if a Padres pitcher has to miss a start. You know, or if yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, he's had his location stuff, and you know, who knows? But you know, who I really think is going to be um, really the key to the Padres' success this year is Trent Grisham. People forget Trent Grisham is Trent Grisham. twenty-four. Or that maybe was a steal of a trade for old. me. I mean, absolutely. And yeah. I love Zach Davies, by the way. R.I.P. Not a Padre anymore, <laughs> but. Um, I absolutely think that that lineup will Luis, hinge you, on Trent Grisham. Luis Urias guy? You're not a Luis Urias guy? <laughs> I'm a bigger Grisham guy. Let's put it that way. Uh, you know, Eric Lauer, whatever. you don't want him? 
what have you done for me lately <laughs> is is the motto of this podcast oh, and I i'll love tell you Grisha, what dude I, I'm I'm was I'm good last year and i i only think he's gonna get better i only well, think he's gonna get better is he the best uh no batting gloves hitter in, in baseball right now i don't know will myers played oh, well, really myers, well last he's year he's another guy they they have the so grisham and myers i have a little bit of a bond then right the no batting gloves thing yeah, they, they probably yeah. they probably have like yeah, the, the thickest grit, calluses the and yeah <laughs> in the bigs yeah that's fair i can't really think of anybody else who's still doing that uh, i think gaddis used to do it but he's not in the league anymore vladdy was yeah. my guy that used to do that really well oh yeah with the tape the tape yeah. on the fingers is the key <laughs> i love that yeah dude yeah i think grisham is, has potential to go 30 and 30 this season and, and you know i think fam has potential to go 2020 but fam i i had a lot of high, high hopes for him to bounce back this year but I look, I don't want to place too much expectations on a guy like that. Who did you hear about the offseason story about him getting stabbed? That was, that yeah, was man. wild. He had like 200 yeah. stitches in his back. He got stabbed I, in his back in like a outside of a strip club. And like, he, yeah. I, I can't believe that he looks as good as he has. He has in spring. I, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's a bummer. He's got one of those, he's one of those guys that has those injuries that just kind of beat you up, you know, like he had a hand thing, uh, getting stabbed in the off season. I mean, he, was, I mean, he almost went blind. He had like a yeah. problem with his eyesight early in his career. Yeah. He's a grinder. I mean, he hit two homers the other day and he looked in mid season form. Yeah. I mean, he's that somebody guy, that could hit like 25 homers and 25 steal 25 bags. Maybe yeah. not, maybe not as many stolen bases now at this point in his career, but you know, still, you know, great he can run. Still. He can, yeah. Yeah. He's making stuff happen on the bases. Um, I think that lineup will it hinges on him too. And that's why I think San Diego is going to be successful because if it's not Grisham, it might be fam. If it's not fam, it might be Myers. You know, yeah. we know what Machado is going to do. We know what Tatis hopefully can do. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any doubts of that. So I, I mean, I think, and you know, Drake, Jay Cronenworth, uh, I, I love Cronenworth. Was rock- I, I love, love that he Cronenworth. plays so many different positions and he's just so good defensively. He's fantastic beyond that side he, of the ball. They stole I mean, him in that trade from uh they got him from tampa bay they stole him yeah great hitter i mean he's he is uh i mean he hit 285 last year with you know like 20 plus rbis i believe i mean i think i think he's a mature hitter that's what i saw from him last year is that he's patient at the plate and sees pitches and he's not going to get he's not going to beat himself so he's a switch hitter I think too that's huge. isn't he or yeah i think no he no is. he's no? left-handed left he's lefty? not okay. a switch lefty for me, um, it's going to come down to whether or not this Dodgers lineup suffers any hangover. Um, yeah, I mean, for, I for me, I don't. I, I know Bellinger's talking about the story with him changing his swing. I don't want to see my perennial MVP candidate, you know, changing his swing drastically. You know, right before the season starts, that's just me. But yeah. you know. I, I do love Mookie Betts. I think Corey Seager is an underappreciated player. I think Seager is a legit NL MVP candidate. That that guy, what he did in the postseason, that's not a fluke. That guy's legit. He's he's potentially the Dodgers' best player. He's that good. Um, he's, he's fantastic. And, he, and he's in the contract seasons. He's he's set to be a free agent um, currently. I mean, his contract's going to be up at the end of the season if he doesn't sign an extension. So he's somebody right. that's going to be ultra motivated to have the big year. I, I, if I if I had to bet on. And if I had to, you know, make a pick for anybody that I think on the Dodgers is going to for sure have a good season, it's it's Corey Seager. I think he's going to be their guy. Um, but a lot yeah. of the ter- a lot of the tertiary players are going to have to step up for the Dodgers. They lost a lot of the like the 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 depth pieces like Jock Peterson and Kike Hernandez. Kike, yeah. there's going to be you know they're going to place a lot of responsibilities on like the AJ Pollock, who is an injury guy. Max Muncie had a down season last year. Will Smith, yep. he's going to be you know he, he's he's a young dude who. All right, you, you won the World Series. Let's see, you know, can you do it year in, year out? Can you be our guy for, you know, years to come? Um, Gavin yeah. Lux. Gavin Lux is the guy that had a very disappointing 2020 season. Let's see if, yeah. if he can come back. You know, there's a lot of questions, mark, question marks about the lineup for the Dodgers that they're going to have to, you know, work through. And I, I think, you know, that they very well can. They're, they they should still be the favorites to win the NL West if you just look at the roster and you give the, the, the give them the benefit of the doubt for winning the world series last season, obviously. Um, but I'm with you. I'm picking the Padres. I just think that there's going to be a little bit of a, a slowness for the Dodgers during the regular season. Yeah. Um, they've kind of mastered the art of like the, the NBA equivalence equivalency of yep. load management. The Dodgers have, you right. know, they kind of, you know, pace themselves throughout the regular season. They know they're going to, they know they're good enough 
to compete and contend for a World Series in the end. Um, so now it's just about getting there and going through the, the process of it. And yeah, I, I think mean, the there Padres just might be the hungrier team, like you're saying. Yeah, no, they, I think you're right. And there was a quote last year. I, I don't know if it was Dave Roberts or I think maybe Dave Roberts was co- quoted. Uh, they said something about, you know, the Dodgers in the playoffs. And he, he said something along the lines of like, yeah, it's been difficult to like get up for these games. You know, we've done so many of these playoff games. It's difficult to get up. And to me, if you let that mentality even sneak into your mind, a team like San Diego is going to come swoop you up. Yeah. And that's exactly, exactly what the, the fear is. Yeah. Um, I'm also not a Trevor Bauer guy. So snooze <laughs> that, alert. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's your, that's your MO. You're not a, you're not a Bauer guy. That might as well no. be like on the, the bumper of your car. Get a bumper sticker. I'm not a Bauer not, guy. Not a big Bauer guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Snap that on the bumper of Nick's car. Yeah. <laughs> not a Bauer guy. I mean, I think he's overrated and I think he's overpaid. And I think um, if you want to pitch yeah. with one eye closed, you should like be good at it. I, I, don't Look, know I, mean. I think that it's incredible. The pitching rotations we're going to see between the Padres and the Dodgers. Like it's historic. The amount the of matchups talent. are going to be unbelievable. The, the, the amount of talent in those two. It's incredible. I mean, we're talking about like rotations that on paper are as good as like the Phillies when they had Roy Halladay, Roy Oswald, Hamels, and, and, yeah. the, the, and, and the, the Atlanta Berets with Greg Maddox and John Smoltz and Tom Glavin. And like, yeah. the, the, we're talking about that type of talent. Like these oh, rotations yeah. are on another level type of historic talent. I mean, and the Padres, they have freaking Clevenger re- recovered yeah, from waiting. Tom and John. He's, he, he'll be with them next year in all likelihood and yeah. possibly in the postseason if, if, you know, God, God willing, they make it that far. So, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I mean, it's going to be a very fun battle between those two teams. And it, yeah. that's definitely the storyline of the NL West for sure. Yeah. Not much going on. The poor, uh, poor Rockies. Yeah. They got to uh, The Rockies Jesus. are my pick to be the worst team in the major league baseball. League that's this, safe. In, I think that's in, a safe in the, pick. in the in MLB this year, I think the Rockies are the worst team. I mean, I think Trevor story, yeah. if, if they talk to story and, why why would he want to stay but i would ask him are you willing to because i feel like the answer you know is no because why would yeah. he if every move that they've made over the last you know year and a half is yeah, after I, they I don't signed know why he would want Ornato to stay is, why they, they don't want to win right now and no. the guy the guy's one of the best players in the sport he he's going to want to win soon and yeah, um, I, I don't see him sticking around if unless they, they should trade him. If he's going to leave, that's my point. Yeah, they should. They should. They should trade him and start getting did. that process going. Yeah, I mean, trade him to get something. Know you, you can't get. let a guy like that just walk away. No, I mean he's he's unbelievable. He's a generational talent, but yeah. we shouldn't waste any more time talking about the Rockies because we already know what they're going to do. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is no not offense. a Rockies podcast. Um, the NL Central, Sorry. the NL Central is a very competitive d- division. I think there's four teams that I honestly would give a, a chance at winning this, this one. You got the the, the uh, Cardinals, the Brewers, the Cubs, the Reds. I think all four of those teams have an uh, opportunity to win the NL Central. I think the Pirates are going to be a, f- a, a fun bad team. I think the Pirates actually have some fun players, some guys that I want to watch, but they're not going to win a lot of games just because I think this division is very competitive. Um, and I, I honestly, it's a shame. I, I believe there's only going to be one team that makes the playoffs from this bunch. And I, I, it's a shame because yeah. I, I think they're all going to knock each other out in a sense. I think they're all going to kind of hover around the 500 mark because none of them is going to be able to get much of an edge over the other is what is what yeah. I mean. I, I, yeah, I agree. I think it's a not very, I don't think the division's very strong. Um, I think that whoever wins the division is not going to be too far over 500. Um, you know, I like, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if whoever wins that division doesn't win 90 games. Um, I mean, I'm looking at your right up here and uh, it makes sense to me. I mean, I like St. Louis. I have a little bias. Uh, I grew up with Tommy Edmond, who's he's going to be playing second base for them because of, uh, you know, they dropped uh, Colton Wong. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I I think they have, I think Flaherty is a dark horse. Um, You know, I like Flaherty over Trevor Bauer. So like that, let that speak for itself. And I, and that's not even a bias. I think he's an, he's an incredible young starting pitcher. I think he's going to get better. Um, and you know, Wainwright, that guy's going to eat innings. There's something about having, you know, long tenured success that can carry a team like the Cardinals, um, to the end. And, you know, you know, baseball, yeah. this is 162. And I think that in 162, a team like the Cardinals might be a team that's going to pull it out. 
I mean, like no the Spurs. They're, they're like the Spurs. At the, yeah. I think the Cardinals and the Braves are like the, the Spurs of the MLB, where it's yeah. like they're just a professional team. They're, they're going to win yeah. ball games. They know right. how to be there at the end, and they're going to compete for a playoff spot for sure. Yeah, the NL Central to me feels like a <laughs> like a golf major championship. It's going to be the guys that hang around yeah, on I Sunday. See. We're, we're you know what I mean? coaching Masters season. I feel you. I got yeah. you. Yeah. It's the guys that stick around until Sunday and then somebody's going to make a move. You know what I mean? Yeah. You see, you'll maybe you see a deadline move here or there. You see something happen. I mean, there's a lot of money in the central, like the Cardinals, the Cardinals have some money. They don't have all their money tied up. And I mean, they have Aaron Otto is being paid by the Rockies. If I'm, I mean, they I think sent a pretty good chunk of money. Season. I think they're paying for there you the, go. Most, the majority of his first season. And then it, it dips really a lot lower after that. But yeah, yeah uh, the Aronado acquisition for St. Louis is, I think been severely underappreciated this off season. I mean, clearly I, I the, the best, I mean, him and Lindor were the best pieces, offensive pieces to move teams this off season, this last winter. Um, and Aronado has been a guy that has, has been, criminally in my opinion slandered for being for not being able to control that the fact that he was playing in Colorado I mean yeah, people I, just I, didn't I can't stand people, that argument people just didn't want to appreciate what he was accomplishing because of the fact that he was playing in Coors Field half his games and look that's an aspect of it and there's going to be a, an inevitable boost that you experience in your numbers in the end but let's let's just be honest I mean the guy is a, an incredible hitter I mean yeah no guy. I I I can't stand the course field argument. It doesn't make any sense to me. I, I, I mean, you can't blame a dude for playing his career where he plays his career. I mean, numbers aside, I think he's going to prove everybody wrong. I think he's one of the third best third basemen of all time. He's uh, a, defensively, he's unbelievable. He's an unbelievable he can swing defensive the stick. player. Yeah, he, he can swing the stick. I think he's absolutely going to thrive in um, in St. Louis. And you know what? I think one piece of of the pie that uh, Nolan Arenado has missed is that you know I you've we've seen him frustrated in the dugout, frustrated with his team because of a lack of performance. You know that intensity. Yeah. I don't think you're going to see that from Nolan Arenado and, ever again. Yeah, that fits the Cardinals mentality. The no nonsense. The Cardinals being a no professional nonsense, organization. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, yeah. The best. The I best. Mean, the best first base, third base combo. I would. I would argue in baseball now with with Goldie and, and Arenado. I think those both those guys. I mean, similarly in their careers have been underappreciated and, and undervalued, you know, consistently throughout their agree. careers. Guys that, you know, they agree. seem they seem to form a, you know, a good chemistry with that duo. I, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. No, I, I think they're they're an exciting team. Uh, I think that they're going to – they'll thrive. And, and you know what? And we talked about the Cubs a little bit, but I, I think the Cubs are you – know, I think the Cubs are in trouble. I mean, I think they have starting starting pitching – um, issues, maybe not issues, but I don't, I don't think they have what it's going to take. And I think their, their lineup is a little tired. I mean, Rizzo has not shown me like best first baseman in baseball stuff in a little while. Um, Chris Bryant has not been the MVP we saw in 2016. Javi Baez is a question mark, um, you know, since last year. And, you know, we talked about Peterson, but Ian Happ, I like Ian Happ. I like Ian Happ, but I think what you, what we were talking about with the Dodgers, I think you, there's a little bit of that lackadaisical feel. Like you get that feeling that they might, you know, sell house and, and restart soon. Yeah. And I don't think that mentality is going to pay very many, very much uh, dividends for for them going down the stretch. All right. So my question with the Cubs is whether or not this is going to be the last season of that core group from the 2016 world series season with, with Contreras and Rizzo and, and Baez and Brian, like, is this their last year? Like in Hayward, like I know Contreras, I think Contreras, Rizzo, Brian and Baez are all on the final year of their deals. And yeah, they, they traded Darvish freed up a, a lot of money during the off season. And it seems like it was in an effort to ensure that they could at least resign a couple of these guys that or, you know, expected, I mean, not expected, but, you know, on their way out. And it's going to be the question with the Cubs is which guys they trade, which guys they keep, you know, whether or not they're contending this season and they need to keep these guys to compete, whether or not they're yeah. having to let these guys walk away and get nothing in return for them besides like a draft pick if they do a qualifying offer. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of those types of questions with the Cubs 
And unfortunately for Cubs fans, it looks like, you know, they only got the one World Series out of this core group of such a promising, talented group of players that, you know, if you if Cubs fans heard that after the 2016 World Series that they were never really going to seriously contend for another World Series title with this group of players, they would be severely disappointed. They mean, after that season, they were, you know, on their high horse thinking that they were going to be you know, one of the best teams in the sport for years to come. And it just goes to show you how, you know, quickly a window can open and close for an organization. And, you know, they really got to, Mm -hmm. if it's your, if if it's your season, if this is your year, you know, capitalize on it and try to try to win it all. Yeah. I mean, we've heard the rumblings about, uh, you know, the culture in that clubhouse and questions on motivation and stuff like that. And you never like to hear that. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, you mentioned these guys, Rizzo, Brian, Baez, Contreras, you know, in their final year of their contract. I don't – I think if they're not contending come August, I, I don't think you see them try to roll that team out again. I mean, the model clearly worked, but it's not yeah. working. You know? I think Rizzo's like, going to be – Rizzo's their guy. I think Rizzo's, you know – I think Rizzo's the guy that they they want to keep around for sentimental reasons. Um, that's but fair. I think Contreras is the one that's for sure on his way out. I think Contreras, if they start to lose games, I think w- will be traded. I mean, it, one of their top prospects is a catcher. Is uh, mm. I think it's Amaya is his name, Miguel Amaya. He's a young, cu- uh, young catching prospect they have. And I think if if he shows he's he's able to take over the job, I think Contreras will be you know shipped off. Yeah, it's funny that you say Rizzo's their guy. Um, I think fan like. Some people would want it to be Bryant just because he had that whole – he kind of led the charge, in my opinion, for that, like, that late call-up type thing, the, mm. the the contract control type stuff. And, you know, Rizzo came by trade, but not that that really matters. But, you know, I, I think there's got to be – I mean, I don't know. What do you think? I think that whenever you you get a guy that has all these trade rumors surrounding him for so long, like, it's got to take a toll, you know? You have a little bit of that World Series uh, – snooze kind of a thing that we we mentioned but also that like paired with the like if you're just constantly in trade talks and your team's kind of scuffling that's got a way on you certainly certainly and you wonder how much of the factors with bryant you know kind of losing a lot of his momentum early in his career yeah you know he had the early mvp award i think it was the second season in the league and he won it um he yeah. got the early he got i think it was only his second or third season in the league when he won the world series um, I mean, he accomplished a lot early on and, you know, yeah. the, the, the middle years of his career now, he's really entered the middle years. He's probably approaching his prime, what should be his prime careers as it's, as a cub or, you know, wherever he's playing, you, we're wondering what's affected his performance because he has not been the guy that we expected him to be the guy that's hitting 50, yeah. 50 plus home runs perennial, perennial, perennially. He's a guy yeah. that has that type of skill set, the ability right. to do you know, so. I said this back in uh, like 2016, 2017, I would like to see him play one position. Um, I yeah. know they kind of had him doing the, that's the left new field thing. Third that's, stuff. that's the modern thing you know, for the positional <sighs> versatility. And you're, you're not wrong. A lot of people think that way where you, the, the multiple positions can really distract a player and, and stretch him yeah. a little bit too thin. And, you know, especially at the superstar level, I think every, you know I mean? think every player is different. And I think maybe you're yeah, right. Maybe, true. maybe you're right with Brian. Maybe Brian is one of those guys that, you know, suffer a little bit because he stretched himself a little bit too thin on some of that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's something to be said for players that make a career out of one position, right? Like, I mean, the Derek Jeter is a Just perfect example, so good right? At like, one thing that you can't get yeah. removed from it. You're the best at or, it. So there's no point in, there's no yeah, point in putting somebody even, else. Not yeah. even, not even from a talent standpoint, just from a routine standpoint. I mean, you look at the last couple of years of Derek Jeter's career, that guy was not the best shortstop <laughs> on the Yankees roster. Right. But like, are, are you seriously going to roll out Jeter at first base or like left field? Yeah. Like they DH him sometimes. And that's the no advantage way. of the American league. But I think that if Chris Bryant knew for, you know, from his MVP season until, you know, now or our future, if he was playing every single game at third base or maybe DHing on one of those road trips on to an AL ballpark, I think that takes a little bit of burden off the guy or, or, you know, I don't think every player is meant to do that. You know, yeah. I don't think every player is meant to go play left field for the last two innings of a game or, or yeah. something like that. Um, you know, so that's where I'm at with the Cubs. I think there's a lot of question marks there. Um, I'm not particularly excited about them as, as I am a team like the Cardinals. 
Um, so I guess we'll see, but the, the Brewers have the possibly the highest ceiling of the bunch. I think the Brewers, if, if everything goes right, if Yelich bounces back, if the Kesson here experiment moving to first base pans out, if, you know, the pitching staff is as good as it could be with Woodruff and Corbin Burns really blossoming as an elite, you know, one, two combo at the top of their staff, like that's a potentially, uh, strong uh narrative that could you know happen around the brewers this season those two guys are really good uh yeah talented would, outfield yeah. too so for me it, what's funny is though with the nl central is you know go figure i think that when i'm when i watch baseball this season my favorite teams to watch in this division are going to be the two that i projected to finish fourth and fifth with the cincinnati reds and the pittsburgh pirates i think these two teams that i don't i don't necessarily think it's going to convert to a lot of on-field success but i like a lot of the roster that they have in place in it both these locations they just don't have they don't have the monetary funds to fill it out the way that i you know that you would hope they would to yeah. have a successful season but i mean the pirates have Kid Brian Hayes, who's going to, uh, he's the favorite right now for the NL MVP in, in gambling circles. And they have a lot of young guys. I think Gregor, Gregory Polanco was a guy that came up with a lot of hype around the, the Pittsburgh Pirates, came up with Sterling, Starling Marte in hopes of, you know, creating a dynamic duo in the outfield for years. Pittsburgh ended up, you know, struggling and having to, you know, have a lot of roster t- turnover over, over throughout Polanco's career. And now he's the longest tenured Pirate, go figure. And it seems like he's only been in the league for, a small handful of years. So <laughs> Pittsburgh is a very fun team. I think they have a lot of guys that, you know, very questionable in terms of their talent and their skill set and their depth, but they also have some, some, some guys who are going to put up some fun stats. And I think like Colin Moran is someone that a little bit underappreciated. I someone agree. He, yep. he, he had a very good season last year. Their closer, Richard Rodriguez is nasty. He's very good. He's a very good closing pitcher as well. Someone who if actually he plays well this season could get traded. Um, but the Pirates mm-hmm. are a team that, while I don't think they're going to win a ton of games, are, are going to be worth watching. They're going to have some fun storylines. No, I agree. I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big Gregory Polanco guy. Uh, always have been. Um, you know, injuries have kind of held him up a little bit. But no, you're. I think you're right. Whether it translates to on-field success or not, I mean, they're definitely exciting. I think in, they finally but, have know, a plan in place. You know, they got Ben yeah. Charrington in there a couple years ago. This is going to be a right. second year. They got the, the manager. Um, what's his name? The new guy. Uh, it's going to be – shoot, what's his name? I don't remember his name, but I was a Clint Hurdle guy, so it's a little it, bummed. Uh, but, Hur- Hurdle's know. not there anymore. It's uh, nope. De- Oh, Derek Shelton. It's his second year as okay. the manager yeah. for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, but – yeah, the Pirates and the and the Reds too. The Reds were a fun team last year. I, I like. I mean, I know they really disappointed in the postseason. They didn't score a single run against the Atlanta yeah. Braves in that wild card round. Um, but the Reds, they lost a lot in the winter. You know, they lost Bauer. They lost their closer Iglesias. They lost a lot. Of, a lot of good players. So th- I don't expect them to have a ton of success if they got worse than the last year's team this year. Um, but I, I just like some of the players they have in their offense. Like Joey Votto is a fun guy to watch. And uh, Eugenio Suarez is a criminally underappreciated slugging third baseman. Who, he might move the shortstop. And if he does, that's a big question mark for the Reds because it frees up a lot of the roster flexibility if he's able to play short. Um, and then the yeah. stock is over to third base. And so that's going to be something to monitor for them. Yeah, um, I, and I also like, think that's one of those teams that like you can afford to have a guy like Eugenio Suarez playing shortstop. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, obviously you want to contend, but you know you do have those factors, right? You don't you don't have your Bauer to lean on every fifth day, and mm-hmm. you, you know, got you, you got to get your best lineup out there. Yeah, so you know if they can go bang a bunch of runs out, like who knows? And, and yeah. like we were saying in the beginning, I mean the the NL Central, I, I think that. I think that the the team who wins the divisions, their record's going to start with an eight. Um, I think it's going to be like an eighty nine win win thing. And it's going to be a it's going to be a dogfight of a division. There's, they're going to yeah. they're all going to like it's going to be like Battle of the Bastards in Game of Thrones, and there's going to be like no winners at the end. They're just going to be all mauled at the end. Very and, baseball, so, a very yeah. baseball dis- uh, gonna, division. Yeah. I think the winner of this division is going to be just crawling into the playoffs and just <laughs> right. You know, right. They, and hey, and we know the we know the for baseball air. postseason. Yeah, yeah, anything can happen in the postseason, man. So. That's that's for sure. Um, all right, let's let's roll into the NL East, the last division of the uh, National League, and then we'll we'll start we'll wrap it up with the American League at the end. And um, 
for the NL East, this is a really fun division. Like I, I, I was telling you earlier, I like every team in this division. I think all of them have a legitimate shot at winning the division. I think the Marlins are underappreciated. And, I mean, I, I did it myself. I ranked them to finish last in, in here. But I just think that what they did last season can't be ignored. And they're only getting better as a young team. They have very young players they're going to be relying on. They relied on these guys last year. They're going to be doing it again this season. And I think that the, the Marlins were just a fun team last year that is going to compete again this season. And um, I, I, I think that this division is just riddled with star talent and, and competitive ball clubs and the, the, the starting pitcher matchups you could get with Jacob deGrom and Max Scherzer and Steven Strasburg and, oh, and uh, now and the Marlins have a, a vicious starting staff with Sandy Alcantara and Pablo Lopez and Sixto Sanchez, who is got a change up that's reminiscent of Pedro Martinez is, I mean, th- there's some really talented ball players in this division and, and it only got better with the addition of Francisco Lindor, who has just completely changed the outlook of that New York Mets team. And so like, we talked about that already earlier on the podcast. And this is one of the most difficult divisions for me to predict. I think that, I mean, I didn't even talk about the Braves who, in their own right are one of the most professional ball clubs in the sport. So a team just always seems to win ball games. And they have one of the best young players yeah. and Ronald Acuna, the reigning NL MVP and Freddie Freeman. There's just a lot of talent up and down every one of these rosters. Yeah, no, I mean, they're exciting for me. I got my eyes on uh, Washington nationals. Um, I mean, Juan Soto is unbelievable, but let's not forget about Josh Bell. I mean, you have now compounded that lineup with two just yeah. absolute sluggers. An off season transaction that got glossed over way too quickly. That guy's Josh way Bell can rake. Quickly. Josh yeah. Bell rakes a little unorthodox, you know, not the most conventional baseball swing, but who cares? I mean, that guy knocks the ball out of the ballpark easily. Like easily. And they added um, Kyle then, Schwarber, who's, you know, maybe he was a distressed asset who, you know, came up with a lot of hype and optimism. Like uh, yeah. uh, one of those 2016 Cubs who really impressed early on in his career, but kind of floundered over the last couple. Maybe that that was a trend yeah. that we saw with a lot of the Cubs players. Mm-hmm. Maybe they just the last couple of years weren't right for a lot of them. Maybe Schwarber is going to benefit from the change of scenery. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. He could be one of those guys. He might be one of those guys that, you know, he's in a new ballpark with a new manager yeah. and he finds a swing again. And you never know. Um, yeah, and- yeah, I mean, I, I am partial to uh, the New York Mets as well because, you know, I'm a huge DeGrom guy. The guy's unbelievable. Um, I think Stroman's just a dude that's I love born Marcus with Stroman. a chip on his shoulder. He's, he's so fun to follow. One of the guys that is really just yeah. truly one of the best ambassadors for the sport of baseball. Loves baseball. Yeah. Just loves baseball. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that lineup's dangerous. I mean, I've always been a Conforto guy. Uh, McNeil's a good player. Literally Alonzo every, might have a little bit of Every player in the Mets lineup is – they're not – there's no there's no outs in that lineup. Everybody no, could hit. No. One through nine. Yeah, that Mets, that Mets projected lineup. It's incredible. And we talked about Lindor. I mean, um, I, what I don't know is what are they going to do with um, Pilar? Is he hurt or what's his deal? I don't know. I think he's going to be a fourth or fifth outfielder if he does make the roster. Because okay. um, it yeah, sounds like Alvaro Moore Jr. And, and Jonathan yeah. VR can play the outfield too. But, yeah, we'll, I don't know how that's going to play out. It, it was um, – Last year, it, with the, the whole story with Joanna Cespedes, you know, leaving the ball club, I think that it's been really big for them to have Dominic Smith, you know, blossom in the way that he has. He's someone that, you know, I'm expecting a big season out of that guy. He's a, a big lumbering lefty out of playing left field for them. And someone who actually, um, I, he, almost, he almost ended up joining the Montebello Stars, um, our travel team. Really? Yeah, he, wow. his dad wanted him to play with us, but his mom was having him play in the RBI program in downtown L.A., and uh, he, he ended up sticking with the RBI program. And he's like, he's, you know, famously known now for being a product of that, that, that youth right. organization, but it would have been cool to, you know, play with a guy that, you know, he's, he's a big league, <laughs> but he's a big league player. He's an all-star caliber player. He's good. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. No, the, I think you're absolutely right about the East, the Braves. We know what they can do. Freddie Freeman, one of my favorite players in all of baseball. The, uh, and I they think added Ian Charlie Anderson. Morton. I mean, the Braves yeah. added Charlie Morton yeah. and, and they're getting Mike Soroka back at some point. He's been, 
you know, moving along nicely in his recovery from the Achilles surgery. I heard that, you know, he was pitching in a B squad game for the Braves this spring and he looked good covering first base. He didn't look like he had any hesitation. Someone right. that he sounds like he's going to be ready to go at some point early on in the season. And the Braves are going to be, you know, getting healthier this, this year. They were just one game away from a world series berth. And so I've seen a lot of people pick against them in this division. I think it's just an a, a tribute to how good this Mets team seems to be on paper, how, how right. good they could be. Um, but for me, it's about dethroning the Braves first. The, the Braves are the team to be. Yeah. They have the target on their mm-hmm. back. Let's see if, let's see if the, the, the Mets or the Nationals or uh, the Marlins or the Phillies can you know dethrone them. I, I, I want to see it to believe it because I think the Braves are a team that they, they, they own this division right now. And I think that you got you to right. dethrone them. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think that Ian Anderson, um, he's so good. I, I think he's the real deal. I think he's mm-hmm. the real deal. And I, I think just compounding that with, uh, with Freed and Morton and, you know, even Smiley is, is going to be, uh, our Soroka. Well, Smiley's good, but Soroka coming back, I think well, they're going to be tough been to beat. Someone, Smiley looks good this spring. He's, he's been, he's been pitching well in spring training. Yeah. Point being, they're going to be tough to beat, but you're, I know you're right. It's, it's almost like, I think that, that I, I look at the East and I almost get Central NL Central vibes, but but better if that makes sense. They're all yeah. just like a little bit better, but kind of dogfighty, um, which is good. I mean, these things are great for baseball, man. Like, yeah. and the Phillies, you, you want these kind of matchups. Yeah, and we didn't even talk about the Phillies. They got Bryce Harper and Aaron and Aaron Nola. Two. Of, yeah, I mean that that could be the best hitter and the best pitcher in Real Muto. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, obviously, I don't want to you know disgrace. Aaron Nola, I mean, um, Jacob DeGrom and compare him to Aaron Nola, but Nola's up there. He's, he's a very talented player. He's good. Um, oh, yeah. So the Phillies are a good team, too. I mean, this NL East is so deep. It's going to be a yeah. dogfight. It's, it's, it's a fun division for sure. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, Agreed. if I was a gambling man for this division, give me the Braves. Um, yeah, I'm not a gambling man, but if I were, <laughs> I would also say Braves just because the Mets, uh, I think they – they have, you know, with the, the addition to Lindor, they have... Uh, it would be very Mets for them to just have a very disappointing season. It would just be so... Exactly. It, it would be You've so Mets. You've seen it too many times, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, if Lindor plays well, but they just don't get the yeah. wins, if they don't get it done in the win column, <laughs> who cares? I mean, yeah. you know, but anyways, that, is, that would be very Mets. So, if I had to bet, Braves. Yeah. All right. That's going to wrap up the National League. Who uh, do you think is going to win the National League? Who do you think wins National League pennant? Going to represent them in the World Series? Who's your Who's your oh, preseason God. pick? It's got to be the Padres, right? I mean, that's your team. Yeah, my what's, heart what's says next Padres. Up? What's next up? Um, uh, next up, I'm going to go um, repeat Dodgers. Okay. Unfortunately, um, um, I bro. think I I think that if the Padres <laughs> win the division, I think they win the National League. Yeah. Put it that way. If they come in as a, as I just think that there's a chip on the shoulder there. I think that I think the World Series team for the National League is coming out of the NL West. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I feel you. I think it's the, it's the best division in terms of the teams at the top. I think that the Dodgers yeah. and the Padres are both possibly the best two teams in the sport. So, what about you? Yeah, I, I feel very similarly. I don't see how you could pick against those two teams if you have to put money on it. I, but, you know, the, the beauty about baseball is it could be anybody. There's so many teams in – it's yeah. very competitive the, this year. Dude, once the playoffs get in, anything can happen. Somebody, I, I can't remember exactly what it was when I was in junior college. Uh, Coach Walker, Santa Barbara City College, used to say every year, uh, he's like, three things are going to happen, happen this year. Somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody, or somebody that you're going to count on is going to get hurt. Somebody that you don't expect is going to play huge, like uh, you're a Rosarena, yeah. for example. Somebody you don't expect is going to show up, and somebody is going to underperform. And all of those things are true at every level of baseball. Yeah, totally, every level. It's a little bit totally. more, you know, the higher you go, it's, it's, it's all about you know, a little. But absolutely, and I think that this is going to be one of those years where. We'll just have to see come October because I think the Padres are strong. I think the Dodgers are strong. But if the Braves were in the World Series next year, don't even call me surprised, right? Like, dude, I wouldn't be surprised if the Nationals get back to the World Series. Or even the, we talked, we, we talked a lot of shit about the Cubs. The Cubs could be a World Series team. And there's a lot of good teams. You never know what's going to happen. The ball yeah. can bounce in any direction. 
I agree. But yeah, for, for a gambling perspective, uh, you got to lean Padres and, and Dodgers. Those are, those are the yeah. two juggernauts. I think so. All right. Let's take a quick break and we'll go into the American League. Vicious Talk with Benny P is the feature podcast of allthingsanalysis.com. ATA is a website designed to create fun, interesting, and accurate content that's all about the stats behind what drives trends in sports, finance, and more. As a young developing developing platform, ATA has a lot of exciting new plans on the horizon, so to avoid missing out on any of our new stuff, please be sure to follow us on social media platforms like Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, as well as visit the website to just to subscribe and be the first to know when new content from our team gets published. All things analysis. We don't report the news. We analyze it. Now, back to Vicious Talk. Okay, we're back for the American League now. Nick and I going over our, our divisional picks for each the West, Central, and Eastern divisions for the Major League Baseball year coming up. We're one week away. Nick, at this point in the preseason, who is going to be your selection to win the American League Western Division? We're looking at the Astros, the Angels, the Athletics, the Rangers, and the Mariners. My heart wants to say the Angels just speak, <laughs> you know, for you and for my West Coast bias. I want to say the Angels. Um, look, I think that if Otani can be Otani, then it's difficult. It's okay. It's hard to any roster. It's hard to shape up against an Otani and a Trout and a Rendon. Like those are three players. And I know three guys don't make a team, but those are three superstars yeah and, and if Otani can about- pitch and hit in the same game I, it's it's very difficult for baseball fans to understand to comprehend the kind of impact one player like that would have because yeah. the ability to impact both offensively and defensively so significantly like that the way Otani is, is potentially capable of like that's incredible he talked about when he pitched and he started the game and he hit leadoff he talked about how he likes it because it could help out with his confidence if he gets a hit and get himself run support as a hitter. He talked about how it affects his confidence on the mound as a pitcher. And I was like, you know, I never even thought about that aspect of the two way playing yeah. experience. Like the mental right. side of, you know, you, you're, you get a home run in the first inning or you get a double, you drive in a run, score a run or something that kind of will roll into your, your approach on the mound. You're willing to be more aggressive and your, right. your fastball might have some more zip on it. You're just got a little bit more oomph behind your pitches. And I think that's, yeah. a, I, that was something that, I thought it was super interesting in what he talked about after that experience where he had in spring yeah. training where he, he hit lead off and, you know, started the game. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it's nobody could, uh, can, can put their mind where, you know, they, nobody can, can speak for him in that regard and, you know, communicate what he's feeling. But I think the other thing that we can't talk about is that that two way player, if he's elite on both sides of the ball, that's taking a lot of pressure off of the rest of the, the totally. lineup or the rest totally. of the roster. Right. I mean, if he's doing his thing on the mound and he's driving in runs, that just makes Mike Trout. That makes Mike's. That makes everybody that makes want Mike to Trout's be better. Job. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a driving force, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's you, contagious. Rendon's a superstar. Yeah, Trout is the best player in baseball. If you have Otani doing what he's going to do, if he can do what he's done in spring training in the regular season, then yeah. I think that they're going to be a tough team to beat. Because yeah. what you said it earlier in the podcast is such a mental game that, like. You, I mean, that's why I think it, the Angels are interesting because right now you're having not one but two players that are doing things that we've never seen before. And if that doesn't fire you up to win, I don't know what will. I mean, yeah. how many times can you just say we have a Mickey Mantle comp hitting in our lineup every single day? <laughs> yeah. It's not a and good then, look. And then here comes this guy who's like Babe yeah. Ruth comp. Yeah, right. it's, it's not a good look when you have a guy that talented, someone who could potentially be the face of this sport, and you know he's not playing in the biggest games that your sport has to offer. Yeah, yeah. So, I um, look, I'm cautiously optimistic for this Angels team. I like what I've seen in spring training, you know, and it's been the story of this pitchy staff every season for the last five or six years. It seems like it's where they get all these retreads who you know they're optimistic about their opportunity to you know regain some 
muster some gusto behind their career and their stuff as a pitcher. And it has, it consistently hasn't worked out. You got the Matt Harvey's, the Trevor Cahill's. There, there's been a lot of these guys for the Angels. Julio Teheran last season. A lot of players that I, 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 I'm forgetting about more of them. There's, it's been consistent every year. They get these discount bargain bargain bin yeah. pitchers to fill up yeah. their starting starting rotation, and then they hope that they can you know have some bounce back in their in their experience with them. And it has not worked out, but. Here's why I'm optimistic that this bunch might be different. This specific <laughs> Angels bunch. Look, I think Dylan Bundy is the chip. Dylan Bundy was a guy who came up with the Baltimore Orioles as the number one prospect for a couple years. He was a guy with he had he, he was a number one overall pick, I believe, or he was one of the top picks in his draft. And um, the Angels really were just hoping to give the guy a change of scenery and hope that they could revitalize his career. And it looks like he's done that. The guy is a legit. Yeah. He's a legit pitch pitcher guy. Got, yeah. He's going to start for them on opening day. I think he's – you could do a lot worse than Dylan Bundy leading your staff, I think, at this point. Um, he, he's legit. He's doing really well. And while he's not yeah. maybe a bona fide ace, I think that the Angels have a lot of 1B guys or guys that are you know, just under that ace – ace caliber because mm-hmm. I think Andrew Heaney is someone who is developing into a very quality above average starter. And I think Shohei Otani has ace like stuff. I will show you, right. on any given night. Otani could be their best pitcher um, throwing a mm-hmm. hundred plus miles an hour with a wicked uh, split finger change up and splitter. Oh yeah. yeah. That, and, that thing is he, nasty. And then when his, his, and his curveball is not bad either. Yeah. So <laughs> just, Shohei has got the best talent out of anybody on this rotation, but you know, yeah. the angels are, have a lot of guys on their roster that they're hoping for a little bit of revitalization to their careers. Guys like Alex Cobb, Jose Iglesias, Dexter Fowler, uh, Pujols is towards the end of maybe his last season of his career. Kurt Suzuki is going to be their backup catcher. Uh, Juan Lagares is kind of a retread coming from New York. It, he was with the, a longtime New York Met, very defensive, g- good defensive player. He's someone who's been playing really well on spring training. So it looks like he's going to be their fourth man um, out of the outfield. Um, but someone who I think is a little bit underappreciated had a great rookie season last year is Jared Walsh for the angels, Jared Walsh, the first baseman. It looks like he's going to start most games at first base for the halos. Um, he had a very, very promising rookie season and he he's done it in his career in the minors. He had like 38 homers a couple years ago in the minors. He was the angels best hit a uh, hitter in the minor leagues two years ago when the, that was the last minor league season. And, you know, not, didn't have the pred- pedigree. He was a 39th round pick for the halos. Um, but you know, someone who is just impressed at every, every level he's been at. And so it shouldn't be a big surprise that he's, you know, made it to the big leagues and then had some success too. So I think he's going to yeah. factor into some other, some other plans this year as well. Um, but it, really a big X factor for them also is Justin Upton. What, what you get out of a guy like, like him, they're yeah. paying him a lot of money. He's probably in the later half of his career. He definitely is in the later half of his later, latter yeah. half of his career. And, um, whether or not he still has some juice left. He, he's a very, he's shown a lot of promise in spring training. He looks healthy. And so if he's healthy, yeah. you know, he's a player that if he's, if he's hitting like he can, he's a good player. He's going to be a big boost. Yeah. for the Hills. But, Yeah. I mean, a lot of moving parts. Uh, it's kind of been the theme this entire year. So um, it's exciting. I yeah, mean, I you clearly, know. I, I, you know, talked about basically everybody on the roster. So clearly, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little familiar with the Halo situation coming to yeah, the season. I, I hear you. I'm a little um, optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. I, you know, I mean, I, I, for the Angels' sake I, and for Mike Trout's sake, I, I hope they have success. Um, I mean, the Houston Astros are a good team. I'm biased against the Houston Astros for obvious reasons. Well, kind of a purist Houston's in that playing, regard. Houston it, we're, is, is an opponent fighting with one hand tied behind their back. They don't, they don't have Justin Verlander. Yep. Um, and they, they lost George Springer to the Blue Jays during the offseason. Um, they're, you know, they lost their closer, Roberto Asuna. I, I, I he, uh, I think signed, signed, signed elsewhere during the off season. There's a lot of guys. I mean, Jose Altuve had a very disappointing 2020 season, whether or not he can bounce back is a major question. Um, someone who he was the, you know, the storyline, whether or not the cheating scandal was benefiting him, you know, more than we thought, you know, that's a possibility. Right. That, that, you know, that's the case as well. So Houston has a lot to prove. And, I, and, you know, they're a good team. If I had to, you know, set the odds for the AL West division winners, I would probably set Houston as the favorite. But in my heart of hearts, I think that the Angels are – there's going to be a lot of they're, – they're due for some positive luck, some, some positive breaks, yeah. the ball to bounce their way 
um, more than it has over the last couple of years. And I think that, you know, this division could be theirs. I think that like what that some of the excitement you have for, uh, for the Otani season, what you've seen out of him, it's for me, it's tenfold, dude. I'm so excited for what Tom Otani could, could possibly accomplish this season. I mean, he, he's looked amazing. Yeah. He's a, he's an unbelievable talent. Um, I think this year is going to show a lot for uh, what he can bring to the table for the years to come. Definitely. And then the Oakland A's, they, uh, in fact, won the division last year. They lost a lot of good, good players during the offseason. They lost Simeon. They lost Liam Hendricks. Yep. Um, their pitching staff, you know, they're going to be relying on Chris Bassett, I think, as their ace, and Sean Manaya. And um, I do like Freddie Freddy Montas. I think he's a good player. Um, but, you know, the A's are a team that – they're going to be trying to do it with a lot of, you know, money ball style players. They're not going to be paying a lot of money this year to their, to their, Mm -hmm. you know, projected payroll. And, you know, they're going to be playing with one hand tied behind their back in the sense that they're not paying as much as their opponents. And so, um, Uh, yeah, if if they can do the Tampa Bay race thing, then like, you know, they're going to be trying it again. It's classic A's. It's going to be a classic A season, a team that maybe doesn't look like the most talented roster on paper in the ALS, but they're going to, I tell you, they're going to compete. They're going to be there. They're gritty. They're 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 probably, if you, if you said I was betting on one team finishing the top two, I'd probably say the A's are probably the best bet. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe they're not the best bet to win, but I th- I'm pretty confident in their ability to um, p- pass up the Angels or the Astros at some point in the standings. Yeah. I think they're just you know a team that doesn't quit. They're always going to compete. I agree. I agree. One team that is super exciting for me in the AOS that's not the Angels is the Mariners, though. The Mariners have a lot of young talent, so I, I don't think they're going to be winning a lot of ball clubs this year. One of those teams like Pittsburgh where – I don't expect them to have a, a ton of on-field success, but I do think that the Seattle Mariners have a lot of young players that I'm very excited to watch how their futures progress. Guys like the rookie of the year last year, Kyle Lewis, Jared Kalenic, I talked about earlier on the podcast. He's a, mm-hmm. he's a, a dark horse candidate for AL rookie of the year, a slugging. Uh, he's a lefty bat outfielder. He came over from uh, the New York Mets in the Robinson Cano deal. He's really, really good prospect. Um, but the, the Mariners have some really good young players. And I think that uh, while this necessarily might not be their season to contend, I think that they have a good core. They're doing some good things there. I mean, DePoto just is constantly tinkering. Their general manager constantly yeah. making trades. He, he, he can't sit still. The guy is right. ADHD with trades. Um, but, you know, I, I like – I like I, some, a lot of guys are undervalued guys like Kyle Seeger, Corey Seeger's brother is who's his nickname basically. Um, and then you guys got, you got like Dylan Moore playing second base and outfield and, and uh, Ty France came over from the San Diego Austin Nola trade last year. Ty France is someone who's really good hitter having a really good spring training performance as well. So the Mariners are trending in the right direction. Maybe not this season. This, they might be a little early, but you know, good five-year plan developing in, in Seattle. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're a team that you've seen, they've spent a lot of money in the past and it hasn't really paid dividends, but you're kind of seeing, like you're saying that the, the young guys come around. I, I, I like that you mentioned Ty France. I think that he's a, he's a good weapon that's going to continue to develop and, you know, be one of those gritty guys that you look up one day and you're like, Oh snap, like watch out for the Mariners. You know, you never know. And like you're saying with the Poto, like he's going to make that move when it makes sense. So he, he kind of reminds me of an A.J. Preller for the Padres in that way, in that, like, he'll get it done when the time's right. So, yeah, you never know. All right, let's roll into the AL Central division, um, a division that is a little confusing to me, it, uh, possibly because the team that seems like the outright, you know, designated champion of this division before the year even starts is the, the White Sox. I haven't seen anybody pick against the Chicago White Sox in this division. And I, I, you know, I think it's a little bit of a slap in the face to the Minnesota twins. I think the, the twins deserve yeah. some more respect They're They've been a, a very consistent organization playing some great baseball over the last few years. And, you know, they're a good yeah. team coming into this season. I think that's going to be the battle between the White Sox and twins, especially after um, the injury to Eloy Jimenez getting that torn pectoral. Yeah. He looks like he's going to be out for like five to six months, they say. So, you know, yeah. it's just going to tighten that gap between Minnesota and Chicago. And I think that's going to be the battle between those two, those two ball clubs. I mean, Cleveland is going to compete just because they're, they're, you know, Cleveland, they're going to be a good team. And the, I think the Royals has some fun pieces and then Detroit's going to be competing with Colorado Rockies for the worst team in, in baseball. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, what's, what's interesting is I, I wonder about the, uh, Tony Larusa pick. Um, yeah. I, is he still, I, he's still, 
Are we sure it Lewis is a good manager at this point in his life? I, I don't know. Sure? I, I mean, I thought it was a weird pick. Uh, and then, you know, then there I was a story a about young, the DUI. exciting team. Yeah, you know, young, exciting team. I, I typically don't think you want um, that kind of manager. I think there's something to be said about a seasoned manager with a young team, and that's where I would have liked a – and I know he's retired, but like a Bruce Bochy, I think, could like take a young team and kind of like – I like push him in the right direction, you know, or like a Ozzy Guillen. He's had his off field issues too, but like, <laughs> I, I don't Ozzie. think Tony La Russa, Yeah. I don't think La is the guy that you want to. Mike Socha be would have been a good manager for them. Socha could have been okay. I, you know, I have interesting feelings about Socha. I think he's a little too hands on, but, but, <laughs> and, but so is La Russa. And, and, you know, and I don't know if that's the, if that's the direction they wanted to go. La Russa. Clearly something in the, he he built up quite a reputation during his time in Arizona. I mean, not not a lot of great accounts of the experiences that people had with him in Arizona. I mean, my my older brother worked with the organization throughout a, a majority of La Russa's tenure there, and from and from his, you know, he's only in the sales department, but from what he was gathering, the organization did not have a lot of positive experiences with Tony La Russa. So I don't yeah. I don't know. I, I agree with you. I, I'm a little bit hesitant to be like, well, is, are we sure this is a good hire? Because yeah, this is a lot of young ball players that well, the White Sox are trying to develop. Like a, right. a coach, a coach matters to a group like this. You yeah, know, it, it does. Uh, and then the game's changing. You know, the game's yeah. changing. And if, and if he's not ready for that change, I think the team will struggle because it seems like the team, the White Sox had some dark years, you know, um, in the past. And I think they're, they're, they're ready. I mean, like you're saying, they're a clear pick to, on top of that division. Um, but I think that if you, if they have any holdups from like a management standpoint, then they're not going to thrive. You know, the stuff that I agree. the on the field stuff is not going to be the same if they don't have that culture and that drive. So uh-huh. it is interesting. I'm not sure if I like that. Uh, if I like that higher, I would have liked to see, um, either a, a younger guy or, 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 I don't know. I just don't think he's the right fit. I think Tony the Roos is the kind of guy that you see managing a team like the New York Yankees or something. Um, you know, okay. you know what you're going to get, you're, you're by the book and I'm just going to give you the roster to do it. So, yeah. Um, and I don't think the White Sox are that kind of team. So I agree with you there. Yeah. So, the, I mean, really, there's not really much more to talk about with the central. I mean, it's the White Sox and the twins. And so I think we're pretty comfortable. Let's roll into the AL East now, because this is, this is a fun division, the AL East. Yeah. Um, last but not least, this is, you know, the Yankees are the presumptive, one of the favorite favorites to win the, the American league outright to win the pennant. Yeah. Go to the world series. Mm-hmm. A lot of people's world series picks. Look, the blue Jays are, are, are very good young ball club. The Red Sox are a little bit of a dark horse. The Rays are always there. This is this division is up for grabs. So, so the Yankees don't count their, don't count your chickens just yet. You know, it, there's there's some some excitement to be had here in the AL East, and I think that the Blue Jays are a team that are going to be keeping a close eye on because I really really like what they're developing now in Toronto. Yeah, I mean, I think the Blue Jays have a health factor. They have to, they have to definitely deal with a couple things. Definitely, um, if everything goes right, I think the Blue Jays are exciting. And but so are the Yankees. I mean, I need Aaron Judge to stay on the field. Um, totally. he's a generational talent. But if he's on, I was the talking IL, about him being. He was supposed to be the next face of the, of the sport, and then you yeah, know, the injuries. Yeah, were, there's it's been two years now since he is right. He had that really good rookie it, season, and that's yeah, and he hasn't played. Uh, I want to say more than 150 games since, or maybe something maybe like less that. Yeah, that. yeah. Um, it, it, I, I yeah. mean, I need him to stay healthy. Um, Stanton, I mean, the guy hit a lot of homers, but I like, I don't know. I, the, I, I, I Toronto, think there's question marks. Toronto got a lot better during the off season. I mean, yes. they added George Springer and Marcus Simeon, two very, guys very are legit. good hitters. I mean, yes. Simeon's going to play second base. He'll have a little bit less. He he was not the best in, uh, fielder at shortstop. His defense no. was adequate. Um, yeah. So maybe second base is, is a better fit for him. Maybe yeah. he can focus Lead more on the, the bat. bat a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Someone who two years ago in 2019, I think he came in third in the MVP, the AL MVP voting. Yeah. He's Sneaky. very good. Yeah. Good. He had a good, really, really impressive season two years ago. I think that last year was, I think there's, he's somewhere in between. He, he, very disappointing year in, 20, in 2020. I think he's somewhere between the 2019 version and the 2020 version of himself. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, Spr- I agree. Springer, disappointing to see that Springer actually got a little bit of uh, an injury in, in the spring training. I think he yeah, he might not be ready for opening day, but I, for my, I didn't hear about it being super serious. So that's good. Yeah, thing. I think he'll be uh, back and that'll be good because Springer is a, he's legit. One of the better hitters in baseball, I think. Yeah. Uh, a dark horse, um, if, he, if he plays 150 games, he's a dark horse to win the home run title. Like he could hit the most home runs in the league. He's that good. It's a lot of homers. Um, Especially in I Toronto. That- Toronto's a very good hitting ballpark. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. No, they're an exciting team for sure. And I think it's one of those teams that you want to see succeed yeah. in that AL East. It's, a, it's about time. I mean, yeah. the Yankees um, are good. But, baseball fans you know, want to root you, for this team. I mean, the young core yeah. with Bichette, Teoscar Hernandez, and Vladimir Guerrero is super exciting. Ke- Kevin Biggio, a Hall of Famer's son. I mean, very exciting ball club they have in Toronto. Yeah. They, people yeah. want to, they want this team to succeed. Right. And I think that, yeah. And I think they, they have an opportunity if they can capitalize. It's another one of those baseball divisions, you know, it's going to come down to the wire. It's going to, we're going to see what well, happens in hell, October. I don't, I don't think there's a, there's a ton of depth in the, the, the rosters across the AL East. I think, I don't think that any of these teams in the AL East can suffer significant injuries to their rosters and still, yeah. you know, work through it. I think that right. there's a lot, there's a good handful of really key players on each of these ball clubs and whichever, you know, team that suffers the best health in that that significant bunch of players is going to be the teams that have the most success if that makes sense yeah, i mean hard to argue with it, that it's, it it's going to be it's going to come down to staying healthy because it, again it, it's the first time that these teams have played 100, 162 games in almost two years now so we'll right. see no you're the pitching right. staff for the blue jays is going to be the big question mark how they're going to, that's whether or not the pitching staff for toronto you know competes and if they're going to get as far as their staff gets them, you know, we'll see yeah, how that's a good, I mean, yeah, that's a good got, take too. You got Ryu, Ray, Roark, Mats, and Stripling, a lot of guys who, you know, not necessarily expecting a whole ton of improvement out of, they are, all these guys are kind of, they are what they are. So they'll have to, you know, stay healthy, you know, out compete the way that they expect them to. So. Yeah. It's an exciting division in the East. I mean, the Red Sox are a team that I'm, I'm very much looking forward to. I think the Red Sox go through a consistent perpetual ebb and flow to their seasons consistently, you know, down seasons going into successful seasons. I think it's a bit, it's a last year was a very disappointing year for them, but you know, they got Alex Cora back after the cheating scandal. He's back managing the ball club from all accounts. They really love him in Boston, despite, you know, Mm -hmm. what happened there. Um, but Boston is, is a team that has a lot of young talent and, you know, they get, you know, mocked for trading a guy like Mookie Betts and getting what people seem to think was peanuts. But, you know, they got some guys that are going to all three guys that are going to be competing for, you know, roster spots on an everyday basis for them. I mean, they got yeah, uh, Verdugo is a good player. Verdugo's a good player. The guy Jeter Downs from all accounts has been, is, is a solid player. Um, and then who was the other guy that they got? Um, so they signed. They they signed Kike Hernandez. Go figure off the Dodgers roster. I think he's a good addition yeah. for them. Um, but you're high on Hunter Renfro too, huh? He's a, he's a San Diego guy that you're high uh, on. Yeah, I mean Renfro hit 30 plus homers in 2019 and didn't start. He only started like 120 games or something. Yeah, you know, I mean he's kind of a guy that I think you he he reminds me of a Jock Peterson. Like you're gonna get what you're gonna get. Like if you let him swing the bat and just let him play. I mean, he's not going to be a high average guy. He might strike out a little bit more than you want, but like 30 homers is 30 homers. And that left field wall is high, but it is short. That guy hits some towering Was, was French Cordero a Padre? Was he yes. ever up? Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. So he, he's he, moved around he, the league now too. And he's in, but he found himself in Boston after the Benintendi deal. If he could, I mean, if that guy can stay healthy, I, he's one of the more impressive players, young players that I've seen. I saw that guy hit a ball in Arizona. I have never seen a baseball go that high up on the center field landed, scoreboard. Right? <laughs> Unbelievable power out of that kid. Yeah, that guy, um, so that you can figure it out. Strong. Who knows? Definitely. Yeah, yeah French, French Cordero is someone that I think could be a, a, a big X factor for Boston. If he solidifies that spot as an everyday yeah. left fielder for them, that could be a major boost for them. Right. Super talented player. Um, but, I mean – the Rays are also a team that is just getting way too slept on for the East. I mean, uh, they, they won the AL, the AL last year. They, they made it to the world series. I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not a fluke that I know they lost Charlie Morton. I know they traded away Blake Snell. They're not as good as they were last season, but they still have 
one, they have the second ranked, I believe, second ranked farm system in baseball. I mean, they have some really, really talented young ball players that will be coming up through their system very soon. Guys like Wander Franco, uh, Brendan McKay, lots of really good players. I, I can, I, I don't really know all of their prospects, but I mean, they're very talented yeah. ball club that, you know, you can't just pencil them, pencil them into a fourth place finish and write them off. Yeah. They're, they're going to be competing all season. And if they, if they don't get hurt, then you, they're a shoe in to, you know, compete for a, a playoff spot in the AL. Yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're right. You can't count them out. Um, I think that the Rays aren't done. If that means like this year, then, you know, necessarily, I don't necessarily think that um, they're a shoe in for the playoffs. I think they're going to have to grind, but I definitely think that you're going to see the Tampa Bay Rays, um, you know, in the top of that division for years yeah. to come. Cause like you're they're saying, not gonna they, get they out the they're going to compete. Yeah. They've, uh, they found a way to kind of do that, you know, money ball thing, kind definitely. of a combo of it. Right. And they've always know, been ahead of the game be, with that. Exactly. You know, the analytical standpoint, they, they do that. Um, what I want to see is I want to see a new ballpark down there. That's what I, that's totally. what I want. And in it's Oakland, the, it's the, the worst ball, that, it's the worst ballpark that in Oakland. It's trash. They're, they're both, yeah. they're both embarrassing. <laughs> it's so bad, but they yeah. have, I have, have you seen some of the proposals? I've seen a few different proposals for the a new ballpark in Tampa Bay. So hopefully that happens. Mm. Be cool. Yeah, they need some. They need some. But anyways, yeah. yeah um, and the poor yeah, Orioles the Rays, the, rounding out that division. The Orioles are going to be terrible. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be the they're Orioles, Rockies, for, and Tigers. Those are those are the three teams that are going to be competing for that that bottom spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going to be a couple of years for Trey for, Mancini. For these though, kinda... Trey Mancini. It's it's the Trey Mancini comeback show. I want to see you know <laughs> that guy come back from cancer strong. He's he's a super good story. Yeah. Yeah, but give me a pick, dude, for the AL East. And look, I think it's it's the Yankees have the highest floor, but I think the Blue Jays have the highest ceiling. So give me a best case scenario, Blue Jays season. I'll, I'm taking I'm taking Toronto. Just to, just you know, be exciting about it. You know, I, if I'm gambling on it, I think the Yankees are you know the favorites, obviously. But I just I, I have, I have yeah. a good feeling about this Blue Jays team. I think they have a solid roster, and these young players are just set like Bo Bichette's on the verge of becoming one of the best players in this sport, like top five, regardless of he's position type of, type of player. He's, he's a yeah. very, very good player. Yeah. I mean, what is he at? Most extra base hits of all time for his like 75 yeah. games or something like that. That's unbelievable. Um, I, I mean, if I'm putting money on it, I'm going uh, New York. I, I, yeah. I, I think I, that, I would you know, probably be the smart money is on New York. I mean, they have a yeah, very, very, I mean, Garrett Cole is, 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 you know, he's a great player. Let's see if the, uh, you know, the, the ball tampering stuff holds up. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I think, I think you got to go for me. It's going to be New York. I would like to see it be um, the blue Jays, but um, you know, we'll see. Definitely. All right, quick. Let's go. Let's go through some of your uh, picks for award winners this season. We'll go through these very quickly. Just off the top of your head, who do you think gun to your head is going to win these, these awards? The, the okay. NL, the NL MVP. Um, Freddie Freeman. Ooh, you want a back-to-back performance out of Freeman plus 1200. It's a good value Freeman. gamblers. If you, uh, if you like Freeman there, give me Lindor Freeman. and plus 1200, the same, same wow. value. Give me, give me a, a Lindor Mets season. I like him. Nice. Nice. A- AL MVP. Trout. Yeah. Trout. Let me ask you this. Trout's the, the runaway favorite plus 200. The next up is Bregman at a thousand plus 1000. <laughs> um, what would an, a Shohei Otani MVP season look like? What statistically, um, like, what would he have to do to win the MVP over his teammate Mike Trout? One, the so Angels have to make the playoffs, it. right? They got to make they, they got to make the playoffs. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so because then it's just indicative of how valuable he was. Okay. Um, I think that the AL MVP is is kind of in it's if it's not Trout, it's going to be kind of an up for grabs like story thing, like a season thing. And what I mean by that is. You know how the MVP works, Store, uh, Baseball Writers Association, whatever. Um, yeah. They're going to eat that up. I think, and we talked about it. I'm not sure what I said, but I think if Shohei wins like 12 games on the mound and hits like 25 to 30 jacks, how do you not give him the MVP? <laughs> like, how It'll do you be not? Interesting. Like, 
it'll be interesting to see how much if if he plays to the potential of what he's capable of what kind of war wins above replacement he number he ends up putting up because the pace he was at in 28 or it was a 2018 when he was pitching and hit, and hitting the pace he was at was yeah. incredible he put up like a like one he put up one war in like a week like right, once, yeah, exactly it, so I don't, the pace yeah. he was at was incredible at times yeah, no, I mean, I think it's going to be if it's if it's as good as it's going to get, it's going to be something that we've never seen. And and I think that you have to hand him the MVP. But for me, it's just going to be if he does it, I think you have to give it to him. Because, I mean, I don't know, I've had come, I've had it'd be, it'd be something with, we've with, never seen. Basically, that's right. what we're saying. And, we and, have and, to and see and a also, season that we've yeah. never seen before. Right. And and let me let me preface that or, or you know, kind of tie that in with I think Mike Trout could have won MVP every year for the last six, seven years. The right? LeBron so, James argument. The, the exactly. thing Kyle Kuzma being like, LeBron should win, you know, however many MVPs right. already. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're going to go with that argument, then I think it works for Shohei Otani as well, because Trout is the most valuable player every single year. But if mm-hmm. Otani comes in and gets 10 wins on the mound and hits 25 jacks, He's, he's the, the best most DH. valuable If he's player. the best DH in the league and he's also a top 15, top 10 starting pitcher, how do you not, you know, give I, a guy like you, that? It'd, it'd, be, it'd be difficult to argue against it, right? Yeah. But so It's fun to think I'm, about. So That's why I yeah. want to bring it up. It's, 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 it's tantalizing it to think about what kind of stat line that would look like an MVP Shohei Otani season. Cause it, yeah, it'd be it fun. Would be, it would be the, something we haven't would seen. that up. Yeah. yeah. The writers the would eat that up and yeah. yeah. It's a it's a story for the ages. So that's gonna be a fun one, but I think you gotta go hands off with it and just kind of let that one ride. Yeah. But I do think I'll put it this way. Let's put it this way. I think that the AL MVP plays for the Los Angeles Angels. Ooh. You never know. I mean, Ren, Rendon's a you candidate too, but uh, the thing with Rendon, Rendon is baby. it would take a trout injury, I think, for Rendon to get it. Rendon trout would have to play like 120, 130 games, and Rendon would have to play like 160. Unless and, Rendon's just plays out of his mind. I don't know what that lineup looks like. I mean, does incredible. Rendon hit behind Trout? I don't even uh, know. Trout's going – Madden says that Two? he wants Trout hitting third. Um, it sounds like Rendon's going to hit second or fourth, probably fourth Dude. most times. And then – If he hits second, so oh, David my God. David Fletcher's hitting first or second. I mean, Fletcher doesn't miss when he swings. That guy doesn't strike out. He hits the ball. Yeah. He hits the ball over his head. And he <laughs> – yeah, that guy's uh, – he's incredible in his own right, too. So – the Angels are a fun team, definitely. Outside of the Halos, if I had to, you know, bet on somebody winning the AL MVP award, I would, I would consider Bo Bichette because I think if Toronto wins the AL East, which I think they could, like I was saying, Bichette is probably the guy to look at as the one leading the charge That's there. Um, That's fair. I also kind of like the value you could get out of uh, Carlos Correa at plus four thousand. I mean, that's that's really juicy odds. And I think if Houston, you know, Houston has a good shot at winning the AL West this this season. Bregman's a really good player, but I think Carlos Correa in a, in a contract year, I believe he's a free agent at the end of this season. Going to be super motivated to have the best season of his career yet. I think he could be a guy that, you know, has a breakout season in a little bit. Yeah, um, that's fair. The NL Cy Young Award, gun to your head. I mean, check up to ground, right? I'm going to Grom, but here's what I'll say. I want a healthy Denelson Lamette to give him a look. <laughs> he's that's what dude, I want. He's got he's got the stuff. His odds are plus twenty five hundred. He's got good odds for NL NL Cy Young. Yeah. He's good. I mean, he's he's unbelievable on the mound. You know, selfishly, I hope that he pitches, you know, I hope he starts, you know, 25 games. I don't know if that's going to happen. From I think a, that the Padres, or... the Padres suffer from having too many good pitchers and the same with the Dodgers. I don't think I think they, they cancel each other out with that with the Cy Young Award voting. It's, it's, it's kind of like with the Angels, how Trout makes it almost impossible for Rendon to win it because Trout. Yeah in most circles is almost always going to be considered the better hitter over Rendon. Similar case. Right. I mean, with, with the, the Dodgers and the, the Padres, I mean, there's not even a clear cut best pitcher out of those bunches. So, I yeah. mean, it's going to be Kershaw or Bueller or Bauer, or is it going to be, you know, Snell or Darvish or, or who am I forget? Lamette or, or even Paddock, if he has a breakout season. I mean, there's there's a plethora of options from all those guys. Yeah. And my, my case is that I think that kind of all cancel each other out. Unless That's one fair. completely separates themselves from the pack, if all se- if all the seasons are comparable, like it, really, how are we yeah, going to vote? How are we going to vote this guy? Yeah, exactly. You go yeah. to the default guy, Degrom, the bona fide ace, the leader of what 
a lot of people are picking to be the the at least winners, the the New York Mets. Yeah. So. Well, and the other thing about Degrom is like you know you you said like you say who do you pick out of that bunch? Degrom is still better than all of them, I think. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's not an inappropriate pick by any means. I think he's I mean my, he's unbelievable. My confusion comes from Degrom being plus four twenty five, but Garrett Cole being plus three fifty for the AL Cy Young. That makes no sense to me. How is Degrom? Yeah, not I don't the, get that either. Yeah, the, the odds the odds makers messed that one up. Degrom is easily the favorite for any Cy Young award within the next year or two. I think the only <laughs> argument against DeGrom is it has to do with the Mets. It has nothing to do with him. Yeah. Um, but he, the Mets have gotten better. So I, yeah. I don't know what that, why that that's like yeah. that. The dark horse value for me out of the NL for the Cy Young would be Sixto Sanchez. If, if the Marlins can compete for a playoff spot, even get close to one, I think Sanchez has the kind of stuff that he's ready to take off and blossom as one of the best next generation of young pitchers to bless the, the major league fields you know Sixto mm-hmm. Sanchez is really really good pitcher he throws high 90s he's got a change up like I said reminiscent of Pedro Martinez he likes to compare yeah. himself to Pedro he's not he's not Pedro nobody is but he's yeah. a, he, he's in his own right he's very good so I like that I, I'll take your your dark horse and I'll raise you Jack Flaherty um Flaherty's he is really impressive good. he's very really good, good but uh you know I don't I don't know that he's a Cy Young but great player Definitely. Flaherty is someone that I'm keeping an eye on as well. The AL Cy Young, who would you go with here? Um, not as I many know, options, I right? Mean, uh, yeah, not as many. I, I, you know, I like Garrett Cole and I respect him, but I don't think he's my pick. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's tough. Too, it's too I mean, obvious Beavers, of a pick, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, I, think, I, that, like it, Beaver, I think those top yeah. three guys are, are the ones to, to, if you're going to put money on it, you got it. It's probably going to be one of those top three, the Garrett Cole, Shane Bieber, Lucas Giolito. Yeah. I like Giolito a lot. I don't know if he has, if he can be a Cy Young, but I do like it. The, well, if it people, was Giolito, I'd be happy. The thing with Giolito is people are expecting a big season out of the Chicago White Sox. And I think that's what this is. I mean, Giolito is expected to be the ace of that team. The White Sox yeah. are expected to be one of the best teams in the American league. So, but de facto, you know, the ace of the, of this team should be, Cy Young candidate. And I think that's G Lito is, is, I think he has the stuff to, you know, be capable of something like this. We'll have to see a jump in, you know, his performance. He was good last year, but he wasn't Cy Young good. So. Right. Right. I do like Beaver at plus 400. That guy's just super consistent. He's not going to have a bad season. He's one of the, he's one of yeah. my favorite pitchers for fantasy purposes. I mean, he's just you throw him in your lineup and you count on a great season. You don't have to worry about him. Yeah. He's not going to struggle too much. Um, right. The dark horse guys, though, I kind of like toward the back end of uh, Jesus Lazardo and Dylan Bundy. If if the A's or the Angels win the ALS, AOS, I think both these guys are going to be serious contributors to that success for their ball clubs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, both very Especially good the Angels. Yeah. So yeah. I think those two guys are decent values, values at 2,500 for Lazardo and plus 4,000 for Dylan Bundy. And then, you know, I'm high on the Twins. I'm an optimist for the Minnesota Twins. I think Jose Barrios – is someone to consider as well as Kenta Maeda plus 2000 Brios at plus 1700. I like them both. I just don't like them for uh, Cy Young. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I don't know that either has Cy Young stuff. I, I think yeah. they're, they're good Great pitchers. pitchers though. Yeah. And I think uh, it, I, both in respect of, to, to both of those guys, I think that they're going to need both of them if they want to make a move in that division. So I think they're extremely valuable, just maybe not Cy Young. Yeah. And a, and a rookie of the year, who are you going with there? Ian Anderson, hundred percent. I love Ian Anderson. I'm mean, gonna give me Sixto Sanchez for all the reasons I've been talking about. Uh, AL mm-hmm. Rookie of the Year. Um, this one's tough for me. I, um, I mean, okay, so like my heart wants to say Rosarena just because of what he did in the playoffs. Yeah. Like I want him to be able to ride that wave, but yeah. who knows? Um. I don't know. Give me, Maybe give, me Franco. give me Casey Mize. Give me Casey Mize. Wander Franco okay. depends on whether or not he plays. Uh, but he is incredibly talented. If he if he yeah. if he plays in seventy five percent, sixty percent of the ball, of the ball games that Tampa Bay is in this year, Franco is a good bet. A plus one thousand. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like Casey Mize for plus fifteen hundred. I think he he he's a dark horse guy. Someone who was a little bit underwhelming in, in his debut season last year, but had all the hype coming in. Someone who apparently made some adjustments this offseason, looking to you know bounce back from a disappointing debut year. 
I think Casey Mize is a good candidate for, for rookie of the year, as well as Bobby Dahlbeck for the Red Sox. Like I've said, he's looked yeah. incredible. He looked incredible in spring training. You can't deny the kind of majestic home runs that he's hitting, yeah. especially, especially to the opposite field. I love seeing a right-hand batter being able to drive the ball oh, to yeah. the right center the way he does. Really good hitter. So effective, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Love Dude, it. what what a baseball talk. I mean, we, we're running on a long podcast now, but, you know, the this is what I'm most excited about for the season. Just so much baseball coming up. Really a lot yeah. to talk about. And I'm glad that we were able to, you know, discuss our outlook for the season because I'm super amped for it. This, is, this podcast is getting me going. I'm ready to, ready yeah, to watch dude. Some, some regular season baseball. <laughs> yeah, man, this season's full of stories and full uh, full of question marks. Which you know, it's funny. It sounds like kind of like lazy podcasting. Like, oh, who knows? We're gonna see, but it really is. It's really like that this year. I'm just um, excited. We're going to see it. You know, hopefully know. we'll be able to see a game in person this year. Yeah, you know? I actually, I just got. I landed a couple tickets to nice. uh, Padres games in the all the that's, way. That's in the, the best part. That's the best part oh, of the yeah. season. You know, oh, it's, it's yeah. been too long, you know, can't wait to, I you know. know, sit in that, that chair, the bleacher chair, put my feet up on the seat yeah. in front of me and Flat grab a bag beer, of peanuts and a beer. And totally looking forward to that. Love definitely. It, All right, buddy, let's wrap up the podcast on some quick opening day trivia. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right, buddy. Question number one, president, the, the topic is presidential opening day pitches. On the oh, first on the first day of the 1910 season, William Howard Taft became the first president to throw the ceremonial first pitch. Since then, every president except two have thrown at least one ceremonial first ball for opening day, the All-Star Game or the World Series. So one of those while they were in office. Can you okay. name can you name at least one of the two who haven't thrown a first pitch in one of those games? Donald Trump. <laughs> you got one. Do you need um, the other one for bonus? Um, He's still alive. I'll give you that. H.W. Bush? Nah, Jimmy Carter. Uh, Carter. <laughs> fun, okay. fun fact about presidential first pitches. President Harry Truman threw out a ceremonial first pitch. He threw out two of them on April 18th, 1950, with both his left and his right hand showcasing his ambidextrous talent. So we had an ambidextrous <laughs> president, Harry Truman. That's funny. <laughs> That's great. All right, question number two. We're, we're one for one here. There has, there has been only one no-hitter in opening day history. Who threw it? Let me give the, I'll give you some options. Pedro Martinez, Mark Burley, Nolan Ryan, or Bob Feller? Nolan Ryan. It was Bo- Bob Feller. The 20, oh, he was the, my second one. The 21 year old Bob Feller pitching for the Cleveland Indians through a no hitter against the Chicago White Sox at Comiskey Ballpark on April 16th, 1940. Wow. All right, we're batting 500. Question number three. Which two Hall of Fame sluggers share the record for the most open, opening day home runs? Can you name one of the two? There's two Hall of Fame sluggers. They, they, they've hit the most home runs in opening day history. They're in the Hall of Fame. So no longer playing. They don't, they, they're tied for the record of eight home runs hit on opening day in their careers. I have, a, I have a weird, weird guess. I'm going to go for it, though. Jim Tomei. It's a good guess, but and you're in the right vein. You're in the right okay. idea of ballpark. But no, it's not Jim Tomei. Let me guess. So I get one more guess because there's two, right? All right. All right. I'll give you a hint because one, one is a left-handed hitter and one is a right-handed hitter. Okay. Um, Hall of Fame players, and, and no question about it, very, very good players. All right, I'm gonna go with. God, this is hard. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, okay, wait, 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 wait. Uh, no, no, I need to throw a guess. I need. Who, to who is the? Who are the best? Who was the best player of our childhood? The number one player that we all idolized when we were kids, like the first player that you liked. I mean, first player I liked is not a Hall of Famer. Um, I don't know, Ken Griffey Jr. There you go. Ken Griffey Jr. and Frank Robin uh yeah, Frank Robinson. Frank um, Robinson. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I was thinking lefties and I don't know why Ken Griffey Jr. didn't pop in my head immediately, but dude, the yeah. opening day thing is uh could it's like anybody's ball game, but I guess you can kind of narrow yeah. it down to go to Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, all right, question number four. You got I'll give you that one. So we're two for three. 
Question four. Which pitcher owns the record for the most opening day starts on the mound? Clayton Kershaw. No, 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 no. <laughs> all right. Uh, That's a good guess, uh, but it wasn't him. All time? All time? Yeah. Nolan Ryan. Nah, he, he was around a long time, but it, he wasn't Nolan Ryan. It was Tom Seaver. He had 11 starts for oh, the New York Mets. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Se- Seaver's, the, Seaver's the guy there. Um, qu- right, last question, number five. Which one of the following opening day stories is false? So I got some, I got some juicy stories for you for opening day, all right? Well, you're going to tell right. me which one is not true. Okay. And be careful because there could be some truths within the lie, all right? Right, okay. Hit there, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> on, on opening day 1907, the, the New York Giants faced off against the Phillies at New York City Polo Grounds after a heavy, after a heavy snowstorm. When the Giants fell behind, disgruntled fans began f- uh, flinging snowballs onto the field, forcing the umpire to call a forfeit in, Phil- in the Phillies' favor. So the Giants fans cost them in the game. B. Okay. That's the first story. Next one. Brooklyn's Washington Park was the scene of an opening day riot on April 11th, 1912. With the Brooklyn Dodgers down 18-3 to to their rival, the New York Giants, fans stormed the field and delayed the game, which was eventually called on account of darkness in the sixth inning. The next one. The Boston Braves fans sat down to an unpleasant surprise on opening day 1946. The outfield stands had recently received a fresh coat of red paint, but cold, damp weather had prevented it from drying. Hundreds of angry, painted, stained spectators complained to the Braves' offices, and the team agreed to pay for their cleaning bills and made a public apology in a newspaper ad. (laughs) And the last one. On opening day 1919, Ray Caldwell, pitcher for the Cleveland Indians, was one out away from pitching a complete game to seal a 2-1 win over the Philadelphia Athletics. And as the story goes, a bolt of lightning struck somewhere within the confines of League, of League Park, and it knocked Caldwell out cold. Some reports said the lightning struck an iron rail near the press box and it made it, its way down to the field and out to the mound. A number of players reported feeling some, some amount of electric shock uh, and Caldwell got the brunt of the blow. However, he went on to finish the game and get the last out to seal the win and start the seasons, the Indian season off with an electric performance. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I'm going to see the paint one. <laughs> that one was funny. It, that one, I like that one. No, it, it was D. There, there uh, was a picture. Man. There was a picture. Was... The story is somewhat true. Caldwell was struck by lightning, but it was not on opening day. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> that was a good one. I was, as I was listening to it, I was like, that's, that's too, too funny to be, to be like made up, but it turns out it was too funny to be true. I just, I was, I was searching for good opening day stories and there were just too many of them. I wanted to read them off for you. Yeah, those were all, those are fantastic. I thought maybe the paint thing was kind of that was misdirection funny. because of like the a Seinfeld uh, episode. Exactly. <laughs> it would be hilarious. Oh, George, George convinced the Yankees to paint bleachers and then all the fans get paint on them. <laughs> yeah, I could, t- I could definitely see that. It's Kramer's fault that he had to paint them, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> he showed up late. Yeah. <laughs> All right, buddy. That was a lot of fun, dude. I'm so yeah, excited. For, I'm really excited for the 2021 season. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, you know, good luck to your Padres. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get your Padres to the playoffs and, and an NL West divisional crown. We're gonna help your fantasy baseball season out this year, Nick. We're gonna, oh yeah, definitely we're gonna help need your, your help with that, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of coming in like sixth place every year. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna help you out, buddy. Anything All you right, want to plug? Any, anything you want to plug? Talk about before you, before we hop off? Anything you, your uh, your social um, media account? Anything you're working on? Any charity you're doing? Uh, we could <laughs> save that for the next pod. You can follow me on Twitter at baseball nick twenty five. There's no K in Nick baseball n i c two five. Nick is a really good Padres guy to follow. He he gets all the Padres radio stations and the fans and the super fans all following him. He's <laughs> he's very liked on social media. You'd be well to follow him. He's he's a good guy. <laughs> thanks man all right buddy that was a lot of fun all right we're gonna wrap it up here episode 65 of vicious talk with benny p remember to ask yourself at the end of the day are you vicious <laughs>